Thanks, uh, Professor Raidas again. I presented to him uh, yesterday, and uh, I think that we can start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyway, welcome everybody again on the day two of my lecture series. Uh, it's very nice and fantastic to meet you again, and I welcome you to my lecture. Um, so first of all, I'd like to share my screen uh, and I'll, today what I will do, yesterday I talked about the overall view of introduction to multi-scale fracture modeling and sustainable materials, uh, particularly multifunctional biocomposites and cellular materials. So the two key important thing, as I emphasize, number one was sustainable composite, which is biodegradable, renewable, environmentally friendly. That's number one. The second thing of important to us is lightweight, because we are interested in application where we want to reduce the weight of the structure. And at the same time, we want to use materials which can contribute to the so-called buzzword circular economy. And that means recyclability, renewability are the key points. Um, so with that, uh, my lecture is divided into two parts. So yesterday I started on the topic uh, which is multi-scale modeling for natural fiber composites, which I will finish today. And then I will start my lecture two, which is focusing on the lightweight uh, uh, material. So uh, let me um, just uh, share my screen. Yeah. Um, just one second, I'll just uh, sort out the screen sharing issues. Uh, one moment. Uh, Yep, I think I can share now. And um, Professor, I'm Marco. Uh, do you have some problem with sharing? Uh, no, I think I'm okay, yep. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I think you can see my screen now, great. Um, so uh, we have started the overall talk is introduction, multi-scale failure modeling of sustainable multifunctional biocomposites and cellular materials. Um, so in this talk, as I said, I have basically two lectures un under this uh, talk. The first lecture was, was what we call, uh, we have covered up to, up to basically the macro scale model but let me uh, just go to the beginning of, of the first lecture so that I can uh, provide, it, provide you a kind of bit of, of the background information for that lecture. So, sorry. Yeah. So the first lecture was coupled multi-scale modeling for understanding failure behavior of natural fiber composite. So here our objective was to understand in detailed level the structure of this material, particularly the hierarchy of the geometry, material, and the structure for this natural fiber composite. And then our objective was to develop a three scale, micro scale, meso scale, macro scale model, uh, which will be able to capture the structure of these materials at individual scales and model the failure and particularly the damage progression from micro to meso to macro scale. So this is what overview I have discussed in my lecture one uh, yesterday, and I haven't completed it. So where I, I will start from where I finished. So basically I talked about advantages of natural fiber composite, uh, the typical multi-scale structure 
of natural fibers. Then we talked about applications of natural fiber composites uh, going further to high-end application in automotive sector. And then we kind of uh, talked about the fabric composite architecture. So this is a kind of a revision uh, from my last uh, talk, which is kind of a recap uh, before I continue uh, with this talk. So we have a yarn level, fabric level, and the composite level. So three different structural scales, which we are trying to understand uh, in this problem. So the first point was, we characterize the failure mechanism at different scales, particularly with composites, there are multiple types of failure mechanisms involved. So we need to understand these failure mechanisms. And once we understand this failure mechanism, we have to uh, combine the effect of these failure mechanics into a kind of a failure model or damage model at the appropriate scale. And as you can see, uh, many of the failure in natural fiber composite involves a scale of uh, 100 micron, which are like about the fiber diameters are about three, four, five microns to maximum 10 microns. So we are talking about the micro scale where we are in looking at the failure such fiber breakage, pull out, uh, delamination between plies or lamina, and also transverse cracking. So the interaction between these different processes or process zones, a complex process zone that is produced because of the interaction uh, of damages between different scale, it's highly challenging, particularly if we want to develop a constitutive damage model, which can then be plugged into a constitutive equation for the material. So this is one of the key slide. Uh, I, I, I kind of talk a bit more looking at the different damage. So then we looked at damage at the fibril scale, different approaches of failure modeling, strength-based, fracture mechanics, damage model, a multi-scale model, et cetera. Then I have described briefly the methods we have adopted in our research. Because this is a quasi-static problem, our, our basic method is based on finite element framework. Um, we are using a mesh superposition, so local global mesh to use multi-scale model between the two scales. One has a global mesh and one within the global mesh, we have an embedded or encapsulated local mesh. And then for under, analyzing realistic structure, we have used techniques like domain decomposition, uh, a, a technique to do parallel processing so that we can analyze real components with the multi-scale technology. With that, we also then looked at multi-scale methodology, FE2 square method, computational homogenization scheme, and so on and so forth. So I have described this yesterday, how we have used these different methods. So I'm just going to the slides, particularly uh, this slide shows how we can have a macroscopic mesh. And within the macroscopic mesh, we have, we use the macroscopic mesh. So this is a macro scale model. We use an integration loop point loop, which means when we hit a Gauss point of an element, we calculate the deformation gradient, which we then pass in to the lower level RV based model, where we then pass it to what we call the FE model, which is embedded, em, the FE model, which is embedded within the RV. So this is the RV based model, which is embedded with the macro FE model. So if we pass it to the micro FE model, where we use the deformation gradient and we solve this boundary value problem, where we can calculate uh, the, the state variables X based on the boundary conditions, which is passed from the macro model and the deformation gradient. Finally, we have an FE program with a microscopic RVE mesh where we can compute uh, the, the sigma, the stress and, and state variables at an RVE level using a kind of a computational homogenization, for example, using Bishop Hill relation. And also an example we have used is MITS computational homogenization technique. So with that way, we merge this homogenization technique with traditional composite classical laminate theory, where we have developed a, based on the help inside formulation for classical laminates, we have developed a, a, a formulation for this uh, natural fiber. This is a pine cone, or you can use it for the flax. We have actually used it for the flax, where we have used these different protein layers or lignin layers. For example, 
middle lamella, primary cell wall, secondary cell wall, we have combined these into uh, this kind of a simplified CLT-based laminate model. But remember, this incorporates different thickness of the different layers. It incorporates the helix angle of different layers. So it is not a constant uh, value across the out of plane direction. So across the Z direction or out of plane direction, uh, this helix angle does change. So when we combine, when we formulate this CLT model, we have to take into account of uh, this kind of helix angle variation for this composite. So this is a, one of the key aspect or, or the new aspect of our research. Uh, we have started from the fiber level, incorporating the fiber architecture into the model. Then we looked at, talked about interface versus interface, and the key objectives were, we want to develop models at each scale. We develop a scheme to link between different models, and we come up to predict the damage and failure behavior at each scale and link between different scale or interrelate or correlate between different scale, but we need mechanical properties at different scales as well. So we had a number of challenges and limitations, for example, variability in geometry properties, complex geometry, and how do we implement a homogenization scheme? So the outcome from the model, as we will, I will show you today, mostly I will, I will show you the results. Yesterday, I have talked about the method and mechanical testing to evaluate properties at different scales. And today, uh, you will see uh, a lots of results are uh, based, on, based on the outcome. So the results would be a statistically weighable strength and stiffness model for flex, fiber polymer interface model, numerical damage model from based on an impregnated yarn. And finally, we will go for a full scale, multi-scale framework with three levels, micro, meso, and macro. That is what we want to arrive at. So some of the manufacturing details, and this is the overall framework of the model. Uh, we have the important thing at each scale, you can see micro scale is fiber and interface, meso scale is impregnated eon, and micro scale is full composite. We have a set of models we develop on the upper side, and the lower side, we conduct tests at each scale. Mesoscale, then we do uh, mesoscale test, physical test, microscale, we do impregnated yarn test, macroscale, we do full mechanical test. And on the top side, we can see different models, microbond model, uh, statistical label model for the fiber interface normal strength models. And we can go and look at impregnated yarn model, yarn RV model, and so on and so forth at meso scale and at macro scale, we have meso FE and multi scale models. So at each scale, we have developed this testing method and model development, which I've talked about yesterday. So we have talked about all these tests, Weibull plot, micro bond test, uh, the fiber model based on CLT and helix angle, Cooper Kelly model, shear Narin model for, for validating the interface properties using a quadratic damage uh, mechanics. And the meso scale, we have done tests like impregnated EON CLT model, impregnated EON model, EON RV model, and meso scale properties. And we did tests of, of impregnated EONs. Uh, and we make this using compression molding and resin transfer molding. And then we can look at meso scale model. We did a single impregnated EON model where we varied fiber dimensions, fiber properties, interface properties to calculate the average homogenized property of a number of EONs. So this is like multi yarn or, or yarn bundle model uh, impregnated with resin. So finally, we developed mesoscale impregnated yarn RV, which was from a single yarn model. So we used a single yarn model, then implemented into the RVE for a multiple yarn model, which we call impregnated yarn RV. You can see the single yarn is embedded in an RVE with multiple yarns to get this kind of results. Then we had a fabric composite model where we have a number of layers corresponding to the composites, which is the lamina. Then we simulated the compaction. After compaction, we come up with a full scale a composite model with the correct orientations assigned to the EN elements with the three, uh, three local axes for each composite lamina a bit correctly, in, um, correctly incorporated. You can see uh, the axis system shown in this, for this component at different layers. 
Then we went to macro scale, and, and this is what uh, we are starting today. So whatever I have talked uh, about this for the last 15 minutes is kind of a, a quick overview or quick recap of what has already been covered in ESTAR's uh, lecture. Now, macro scale is where we are starting from. So macro scale, we have done a set of mechanical tests, particularly those tests were useful to develop meso FE models and multi-scale models. So these are the key things we benefited uh, from macro scale model, which, which use the input of mechanical test data. So these are very standard tests we use, not uh, any specialist uh, thing like three-point bend, uh, tensile test, uh, shear test, compression test. This is the shear. We did shear test. You can see the specimen is kept between two flat panels and the two flat panels move in opposite direction, which introduces a shear in the specimen. Then we have done a three-point bend test where we uh, try to characterize the bending behavior of, of the composite. This is a macroscopic composite. We want to predict the response of these specimens from the three-level multi-scale model, macro level, meso level, and micro level. So this is the ultimate goal. So shear test, tensile test, three-point bend test, and compression test we have done. The idea was to all these tests to characterize damage quantification is key thing, which we use STM standard routine test for composite. Now, how do we do how did we experimentally quantify damage? So this is very important. When we are talking about failure modeling or damage modeling using a multi-scale approach, we have to have a very accurate detailed way to observe the damage and then characterize the damage. So what we did after the test, we took the failed specimens and we sectionized them to look at the cracks. Okay, you can see the cracks happened in a specimen. And you can see the fibers or, or rather than the eons, which are white color or whitish color. And you can see the matrix, which is the gray color. And you can see a lot of damage between the eons. Some of the cracks go through the eon as well. So what we did, we collected thousands of pictures like this from different sections of the composite of, of, of the failed specimen and the failed specimen cross section. Remember, we are trying to statistically quantify this damage. So we can't just take one picture and say, we take this picture as, as of our damaged specimen. We have to uh, uh, make uh, such kind of uh, image scan. We have to make multiple of them and we have to quantify from various cases. So each image, we did what we call an operation, thresholding and skeletonization, which will just highlight the crack and then we used an image analysis to identify the crack length, crack area, and crack location. And that's why with a section of about, say, a one millimeter by one millimeter. So this is what you can see. It's one millimeter by one millimeter piece of section. We can identify at such a micro scale and meso scale damage level experimentally so that we have real value to compare with our model. Then our basic test was uh, this uh, a flexure of three-point bend test. Why we have used this? Because composites, we normally test three-point bend because it introduces both compression and tension. So we can characterize the compression, under compression load, and under tension load, uh, the behavior of the composite, particularly failure, delamination, under compression, and sometimes crushing under compression, under tension, fiber failure, matrix cracking, uh, and compression, we can get also sometimes delamination. So we can particularly delamination is well captured using a three-point bend test or a flexural test. So we did the flexural test in the lab, and we did a virtual setup of flexural test in our model. This was our macro model. We used a support roller. We used a loading roller. This was the plane of symmetry. So we actually modeled half of the specimen. So we modeled, you can follow my mouse. We actually modeled this part. 
So we model actually this part and we use uh, a symmetric condition uh, in this part, okay? And then uh, we have used different stages of software. Obviously the macro models were best analyzed using uh, Abacus program, but our multi-scale model was embedded within the Abacus. So we had another finite element program uh, for each RV, each RVE within the macro model, which was called from the macro model program in Abacus, okay? So that is what we have used in this case. So this basically um, describes how this meso, micro, and macro model work in terms of modeling the three-point bend test. So when we do the three-point bend test model, we calculate the displacement at all the nodes of the macro model, and we pass it to the discrete ER model, which is the mesoscale model. It uses this displacement gradient to calculate the damage parameter and the damage in the discrete eons. And it passes those damage and the deformation, which means the displacement gradient and displacement field with the eon to that impregnated eon model, impregnated eon RV, where we run the micro model to quantify, numerically quantify the damage law. And this damage law is feedback to the meso model, which then can calculate the damage variable or damage tensor. So damage tensor is calculated in the meso model, which is the continuum damage variable D and, and passed it to the macro model. So this whole process is in a cascading manner. So you can see macro model, it's a top down and bottom up approach. So macro will feed to meso, meso will feed to micro, micro will feed back to meso and meso feeds back to macro again. Now this process is illustrated mathematically sorry, uh, mathematically in this diagram, which I have explained, this is the macro, uh, macro model, which is passing on at each integration loop, at each Gauss point, the macro gradient, which is then passed to the meso model, which uses the RVE mesh, and then compute sigma RV, the RV stress and state variables in the RV. And this is fed by the micro model. So let us now look at the results at different scale. This is the key thing which I'm going to show the last part, how, how the results look like and what type of results do we get, which we can compare between the model prediction and experimental value or our estimated value. So let us look at, at micro scale where our focus is fiber and matrix. So we have done physical tests and micro scale tests, particularly micro bond tests. And we have also done a micro bond model numerical. And we have developed a fiber analytical and variable model. And then we have also developed an interface normal strength model. But how do we validate and test these two models now? So what you can see, this is the plot between E11, which is the longitudinal Young's modulus of the, the, the composite, uh, the lamina, with the helix angle of the S2. S2, you remember, the secondary layer, the second secondary layer. So this is one of the results. I have just uh, picked up uh, just a small set of results to show you, and there are more results as well. So what we see, there is a huge sensitivity with the helix angle. So we can see at an helix angle of nine degrees, the E11 value, the experimental E11 value matches our computationally predicted E11 value. And in reality, for flex fiber, which we have used for our model, they have a helix angle of nine degrees. So that shows, yes, if we apply our model to flex fiber composite, which has a S2 helix angle of nine degree, our result, which is predicted by this point, would be close to the experimental value of about 52.28. So we can see that for different gauge length, which we have tested to account for the variability of the fiber properties, we can see the E11 values are 
quite variable, first of all, for the first gauge length, second gauge length, third gauge length, fourth gauge length. So the property has a huge variability. That's the first observation. And that is due to the nature of the natural fiber. And that is the reason we have to use a number of gauge length. And we have to use the statistical parameter alpha and beta, which are the fiber wavelet distribution. And you can see why we have used wavelet distribution rather than a deterministic statistical distribution because of the variability in the measured experimental data, okay? So this is the micro scale results we got. And then what we have done, we have predicted the micro bond test. Remember the micro bond test we showed you? You have a blob of matrix, you put a fiber through it and you pull the fiber. And you basically determine at what load of the fiber, the fiber matrix interface fails. You get a fiber matrix interface failure, that load, okay? And that is the interface model. So we found in this case, a microbond model for two type of composite, flax PP and flax epoxy. With this is the load deflection curve. And you can, you can see the load extension curve for all cases. Uh, this is the interface test results, okay? So interfacial fiber matrix, interfacial shear stress, and this is the interfacial normal stress, okay? So you can see from here, we can get the interfacial shear stress and interfacial normal stress from this graph, okay? And you can see interfacial shear stress has some variability, whereas interfacial normal strength does not have that much variability. So these two values, interfacial shear strength and interfacial normal strength, which we determined from the micro bond uh, test was used in the micro scale model as an input. So you could see the typical load deflection. So these are the points. So once you apply the extension, you get a linear part, and then you get, these are the points where fiber starts separating from the matrix. So these are the points where you basically get interface failure, okay? And suddenly, the load drops in, in the fiber, okay? So you can quantify your interfacial normal strength and interfacial shear strength based on this. So let's look at the mesoscale results now, which is, which is this scale. And this is the stress strain diagram. Uh, red is experiment and blue is the model prediction. So ultimately we want our model to predict the experimental stress strain diagram accurately, provided we are able to characterize the damage mechanisms correctly, the damage, the physics of the damage processes correctly, and we are able to incorporate those damage processes, the physical damage processes into our numerical model, into our mathematical model of the damage tensor. So you can see the simulation matches well, the initial stiffness part, and this is the failure point predicted by simulation, and these are the experimental data. So this is experiment, uh, this is simulation point. These are two different composite. This is flax polypropylene, and this is flax epoxy. So we can see uh, there is a good correlation between experiment and simulation. Experiment is, Experimental interface, experimental uh, failure strength is 24 megapascal, whereas the model predicted failure strength was 22 megapascal for flax PP. For flax epoxy, the experimental failure strength is about 70 plus minus 10. So there's a lot of variability. The model prediction is about 85. So what we can say for flax PP, our model was within five to 10%. For flax epoxy, our model was within the 15%, I would say, which is fairly accurate given the complexity of the damage mechanics at various scales. You have to understand what we are seeing, the mesoscale model. This is actually uh, predicting the stress change response based on the microscale model data being input to the mesoscale model. So it's a dual scale model prediction, not a single scale prediction, okay? So an accuracy of 
is not too bad given the complexity of the damage mechanism. Then we looked at the mesoscale model and how can we calculate our damage tensor parameter, what we call uh, the numerical damage mechanism, because we want to fit a polynomial for B11, uh, which is uh, the 1, 1 direction, the fiber direction uh, damage tensor value. And the way we did that, we plotted the damage, uh, this B11 versus strain, and we fitted a polynomial, which in this case was a third order polynomial. And, and, and we can see the damage in the matrix elements at 0 0.00 strain in flex PP happened. So when the strain was 0 0.002, we find damage in matrix. We found for flex PP, the damage in the matrix happens at a much higher strain of 0 0.01. And that's because uh, polypropylene is a more ductile matrix. So it has got a lower stiffness or higher flexibility. So it kind of starts to get damaged in the matrix, uh, matrix domain quite earlier at a lower strain. So you could see. Um, uh, this is the value which the damage starts for flax epoxy, which is 0 0.01, uh, and which in this case of uh, in this case of flax PP polypropylene, it is quite low value, which is 0 0.022. And then we have used a third order polynomial fit, which will characterize my damage tensor parameter with the strain parameter. Then we move to do for further do damage quantification. So basically we try to find a rule how damage changes with the strain. And you can see for flax PP, we found because the, uh, both the fiber is same, both the fiber is flax. For first material system, we use polypropylene, which is thermoplastic. The second material system, we use epoxy, which is thermoset. So that showed the difference for thermoplastic, the damage variable is a, a kind of a, a, quad, a quadratic function. So it's a parabolic function of the strain. Uh, and you can see these are the actual points, uh, D11 and D22. So this is the damage variable for both the fiber or longitudinal direction, and also the two direction or the transverse direction of the lamina as well. So we have characterized damage tensor in both directions, D11, the fiber direction, D22, the transverse direction, because this is an anisotropic damage mechanics. So we cannot assume the damage tensor to be isotropic, okay? So these are the real points from experiment, and we can see these are the feed value. And how did we calculate these points from the experiment? Using the damage quantification, which I have shown based on image analysis. Whereas for flax epoxy, we found the relationship is linear. So anyway, we have got this data and then we fit a linear line and we found damage can be quantified as a linear. And the story is, why is it so? You can ask me question why, and that's led to the material constitutive behavior. Polypropylene is thermoplastic, so it has a ductility more. It follows more of a nonlinear damage mechanics. Epoxy is more brittle. So when the matrix gets damaged, it's like a brittle fracture, okay? So it's, it's as a result, you get a linear relation between the damage and the strain. Then what we did, we looked at the results from the meso model where we have used a fabric composite model and we have uh, compacted it, simulated a compaction and then used a full amplitude EN model. And we fed back the meso model and multi-scale model to, the, to calculate the macro scale properties. So this is the final stage where we have used, see this is the way RV was used. So we have divided, this is the full composite, uh, at, uh, but these are mesoscale. So these are mesoscale RV. You can see we are choosing sample RVEs of different size. So we choose the RV of 0.6 millimeter, we choose the RV of one millimeter to see the convergence of the RV towards an unique solution so that the RV size, so, Yesterday, we were talking about size dependence, and this is the size dependence we tested. We talked about, we investigated the size effect of the RVE on the solution, and we chose an RVE where the size effect was eliminated. 
So once we have done the RB, we fed back the mesoscale model output into the multiscale model, and we then uh, compute the macroscale property. So this is the final part where we talk about the results for, for the macro scale, where we have used this three-point bend test as a model test. So we got the displacement uh, from, from macro scale. We fed the displacement to the uh, discrete EAN model, uh, which then went back as a deformation gradient to the impregnated EAN model at the micro scale. And the micro scale gives us the damage log coefficient with, to the uh, meso model, discrete EAN model, which then goes back to the macro scale composite model. Once we get the damage tensor characterized from the, from the uh, meso model, we can then predict the damage mode of the composite. So this is what we see the final results. This is the final. This is what we test in lab. This is what engineers want for the design of aircraft, design of automotive uh, vehicles, design of transport, design of marine boats, you name it. Design of building part, building, building components using composite. We want a high quality predictive tool and a multi-scale framework to predict. What is the prediction? Stress and response, what is that? Stiffness and strength, modulus and strength at macroscopic scale, at bulk scale. People, engineers don't care how you do it, but we have shown to be able to predict the composite properties at a bulk scale, at a macroscopic scale, you need to understand the damage mechanisms at different levels, the hierarchical structure of the composite at different levels, from micro scale to meso scale to macro scale. So you could see the experimental data is red, numerical prediction is black, and the numerical prediction is blue. So two different types of simulation, the first simulation we used a damage quantified rule, and the second simulation we use a numerically evaluated damage. And you can see for flax PP with a volume fraction 0.22, the experimental data matches very well with the simulation. For flax PP, a higher volume fraction, the, the numerical and numerical and quantified goes well. Experimental data show a little bit of lower stiffness, but the strength prediction is matching using the numerical value. But the stiffness is a bit over predicted. And that's because when you have a higher volume fraction of fibers, like 40%, we normally uh, don't use 40% fiber. Fiber normally 30, 35, 20, you know. If you have 40% fiber, then there is an effect of the interaction between the fiber that effect is not taken into account in the model. Because then if you have a lump of fibers, then this lump of fibers uh, tends to be uh, less stiff because you do not have enough matrix between the fibers to hold it, to transfer the load, okay? So the stiffness drops. That's why we see experimentally, uh, the stiffness is slightly lower than numerically predicted for higher volume fraction. So you can see for lower volume fraction, for flex PP, experimental average is 115, quantified joules, 107, numerical damage to 100. So very good, very good quality prediction. That is what we want. For higher volume fraction, we are a bit off, particularly the quantified joule, in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of the strength, the failure point here. But numerically damage is still good. So 174 and 181. The quantified value is a bit off. So at least we can rely, tell the numerical damage modeling was able to predict the strength at the lower volume fraction as well as the higher volume fraction. Now, this is the same result for flax epoxy. We have used two different uh, volume fraction. Again, we can see our flax epoxy prediction. So this is our, our experimental data with the experimental error bar. This is the quantified model. This is the strength, and this is the numerical model. So we can see there is a bit uh, spread in the strength prediction for flax epoxy, particularly uh, for lower volume fraction and also uh, in the higher volume fraction. But what we see here, this is the experimental average with error bar, and we, our predicted values is about 
uh, the numerical rules are good. See, 325 to 79. So about, um, say about 10% error, 10% difference, okay? These two. Um, for uh, higher volume fraction, we can see again, 349, 371. So the numerical model is the best, which takes into account of effect of macro scale, meso scale, micro scale. The quantified rules, which normally people use, these are not very accurate, particularly when the multi scale failure mechanics are present. So, what I was suggesting, we should not use the quantified rule, which many people use in damage prediction for composite materials. Finally, our macro scale result. Uh, this was, of course, the result for the mesoscale impregnated EON results. So we are presenting results at each scale. And finally, we present the macro scale result, which is uh, the red is, of course, experiment and blue is the prediction. So you could see uh, for two different volume fraction of fibers, 0.22, lower volume fraction and 0.41, we can see very good quality prediction between the experiment and simulation at the macro scale both at a low volume fraction of 0.22 or 22% and high volume fraction of 41%. So this difference is within 10% for both cases, which is very good prediction. And in real application of composite, we simulated this bending test and this prediction was what matters at the end. Are our multi-scale model, which takes into account the fiber architecture at micro scale, the impregnated ion properties at mesoscale, and the finally the macro property of the composite at the micro scale. So material difference and the composite geometry and the composite structure, that's one side. Second side is damage mechanics. Micro scale defibrillation, fiber damage, fiber separation, um, matrix damage, fiber pullout, all these mechanics, delamination at mesoscale, all of these mechanics, damage mechanics are incorporated in this model to be able to predict this kind of quality prediction, 10% uh, difference from experimental data. And this is very important because any models you use, you need to have validation. This was the bending. Second was, again, this was flax PP. Then we did for flax epoxy as well. And again, we see very good quality prediction for a lower volume fraction and the higher volume uh, fraction as well. So experiment is 296, simulation 236, whereas there's difference between experiment and simulation is, is within, again, again, maximum 10%, okay? 10 to 10 to 15%, I would say. So very good quality prediction. Uh, and this tool has been used uh, further in our design, design group, the composite design team within our center for designing composites for automotive components, and we are also now applying this tool for aerospace components. So to summarize the first talk, numerical models were able to account for interface properties, fabric geometry composite models able to predict composite failure, multi-scale computational model for natural fiber composite was able to produce good results as you saw, particularly to show the failure mechanisms. And finally, what you can live with, it can be used as a great predictive tool, very good predictive tool provided, provided very important, you investigated suitable scales and appropriate damage mechanisms and input properties have to be determined at each scale. You cannot just do some mechanical test at the macro scale and assume the properties at micro and meso scale. That will be no good. That will be a significant approximation to your analysis. So you need to determine the appropriate properties at each scale rather than assuming some numbers, some estimated approximated numbers at different scales. So that was the success for the model. So future applications, we are looking other natural fibers, different type of composite architecture, cross fly, <coughs> cross fly oven, woven architectures. We are trying to incorporate time dependent effect, effect of fiber treatment, and we are using uh, for more scales and more extensive parallelization so that we can really analyze large industrial components. So these are some of the uh, journal papers which have been uh, published. So conference and journal papers. So these are some of the key publications. Uh, these are some of the conference presentation. We have presented this work. 
uh, in, 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 in different composite conference. Uh, we have presented this work in International European Conference on Fracture, International Conference on Composite Materials and Polymer Composites. And these are uh, the key journal and conference publications. So these three journal publications you can access, uh, which gives you more details about uh, the work I presented. So finally, I want to acknowledge this work, particularly all students and collaborators are highly thankful. We, we acknowledge our funding from Ministry of Business, Innovation and Environment, uh, Business, Innovation and Employment uh, from New Zealand government. And obviously a thanks for the first part of the lecture to our famous uh, professor Patricia Tuvalosi and the group, um, you know, Ana Maria, Nicolas and Marco. They have been great, uh, great guys, you know, very helpful and also the structure uh, and the structure and geotechnical engineering for this part. Obviously, I have a second lecture, uh, part of the lecture, which will talk about uh, lightweight material, but this part involved a lot of my students. Uh, you can see some of them in, in the picture. <clears throat> um, so if uh, I, can, I can start the second part, or, or, or if um, you wish, I could, we could go for um, a short break and, and then start. So it is, it is up to, uh, up to uh, up to you how you how you want to how you, how you want to do maybe five minutes break would be okay <laughs> right i have a bit, bit a small problem <laughs> As I cannot see you in the screen. Anyway. Oh, okay, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. One minute, one minute. No, 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 this is a problem of our uh, representation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can you see me now? Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. No, no, it was a problem in our, uh, in our room. And uh, thank you again for uh, your uh, contribution. And uh, I think that we can open discussion if. Uh, someone uh, would like uh, to add something to the discussion of uh, yesterday. Ecco, yeah. c'è una domanda. Majid, please. Majid. You can stop the sharing, uh, the screen sharing. Well, that's okay. I can maybe explain through some of the questions, through the slides. If, if that is required, I can explain it here. Okay, uh, write uh, your question in the chat. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, how do I see the chat? Let me see. Okay, it's possible to explain again. Uh, uh, he he has, is uh, asking uh, if possible to explain again the numerical and quantified damage models. Okay, and yes. Difference, and differences. Yes, so uh, the numerical is, is when you are calculating the damage tensor based on the micro and mesoscale model. That is the numerical model you are solving using the finite element because finite element method is a numerical method, right? So when we are solving using finite element and using the damage tensor within the finite element formulation, that is what we are calling the numerical damage model. Now the quantified rule is I showed you uh, the fitting. We had done the car fitting. We calculated the damage for all the specimens and then we have done a car fitting to interpolate the damage at various chains, right? So, so that is what we are quantifying the damage. And that is what we are calling using quantified damage rule. If that makes sense. So the fitting, if you fit the damage, so you experimentally measure the damage and you use car fitting, okay? To fit a polynomial curve, to monitor, to, to check the damage coefficients with strain. So it's a strain damage relationship quantified based on experimentally measured value and that fitting that value with the curve. That's
that's the quantified one. Okay, the quantified is not bad, but as you have seen, it is not very accurate when you want to predict the macroscale response. So people have tried to use this quantified damage, which is okay, which is good. But often the car fitted response of these damage tensor values are not highly accurate. But if you use the numerical model, which is much more accurate because you are resolving the damage at different scales. And as you saw uh, from the accuracy of the results, in fact, uh, let me show the accuracy. Um, um, so we are showing the quantified damage rule often can be, uh, so this case, both are accurate, but you can see for a uh, higher volume fraction, your quantified rule fails because you have more fibers. More volume fiber means less matrix. So the load transfer physically is disabled. And that is not captured in the quantified model because it still follows the fitted curve. It doesn't take into account the change in mechanics of load transfer, right? So the quantified damage model is not very accurate, whereas numerical uh, damage model or numerical rules based damage model, what we call, is still remain, maintain its accuracy within say, uh, you know, 15%, you know, I would say we, we got. Any other questions? So you are all enthusiastic students. I, I really like to have you, uh, you know, and like to meet you in, in Roma. Maybe, maybe I, I take the plane now. Huh? It is a bit uh, difficult uh, way of interacting or of interact through the uh, computer. And uh, yes. it is also difficult to ask for questions. Uh, any other yes. question I, I, I can answer? A question in the room. In the room. Oh, okay. Nicolas wants to ask. Uh... Hello. Oh, Nicolas. Hi, Nicolas. Very, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, did you test any other natural material rather than flax? Yes. Because uh, we I, have, I, I did we, some, sorry, I did some uh, small research in this, uh, in this field with natural fibers. And according to the numbers we got with flax, uh, basically is the best natural material to use in terms of strength and also density. I don't know if you got the same results or some. Yeah, other. look, uh, the reason we have used flax because uh, our companies, uh, particularly the application was automotive and building uh, composites. But now we are thinking of aerospace, not load bearing. So we can't replace carbon fiber, glass fiber with flax for aerospace, never. Uh, maybe not in 50 years. All where we can use in aerospace this flax is interior components, which are not highly loaded. But we can definitely use this in automotive and, um, and, and buildings and, and some marine applications, which are not high load bearing. Not, you don't need very high strength and stiffness. So out of this all, flax is the best. And that is why we took the flax as a standard material for this whole multi-scale uh, model development and multi-scale framework development. And we had a good facility to test flax-based composite. We could make it at different scale, like microbond test, mesoscale test, macroscale test, RV yarn test, and so forth. So we could characterize it very well. In terms of your question, have we used other composite? We are uh, other fiber. We have also used hemp and we have also used uh, jute, uh, but they are not as good. Jute is not that bad. We are uh, have done some tests to characterize jute fiber composites. And we want to intend to apply this model to see how the jute fiber composite uh, responds to this model, whether it fits to this multi-scale model. But we hope if we can characterize all the input data, mechanical properties at different scales, then we would be able to predict the response. Uh, Thank you very much. And another question from uh, the audience, our PhD student ask for knowing uh, the uh, for knowing the commercial finite element uh, software used that. Uh, uh, we suppose uh, is uh, abacus uh, or uh, something else. Abacus. 
So, uh, okay. Did, did you use Abacus for uh, your uh, all uh, your simulations? No, no, no. So Abacus only at the macro scale, at the bulk scale, uh, because it it uh, it is just to do the global FE analysis. Then from Abacus we have got a connection using UMAT subroutine to our. Uh, mesoscale finite element solver, which we wrote ourselves. And then the mesoscale solver calls the microscale solver, which we wrote ourselves. So only one, the macro scale was Abacus. Because macro scale data is relatively easy. If you can send the damage tensor in macro scale, and if you can compute the deformation gradient, you just pass the deformation gradient to mesoscale. So we don't need to write a new FE program. We can use Abacus because it can calculate and give those data to us. And with Abacus, one of the good thing is, the practical thing is all our industry partners, like our automotive company, the building partners, they all use Abacus. So if we tell, this is our model, you, you add it to your Abacus code and use it, they will be more confident. You know, they can then use it for their design. Otherwise, if we write a code, the industry people, they are not, they are not multi-scale modeler. So they won't, they won't be able to handle. So they won't give us money to run the project. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, just to, to be sure, is your lecture of today finished or are you asking for a, a short break? Uh, I, can, I can continue with my next part, no problem now. Up, 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 to, up to you, I am happy, anything happy no, with no, me. No, 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 we are, we are uh, planned uh, to, to, to talk with you till uh, 11.30. Yeah, so. So can I can I start my second lecture now? Yes, if you want to stop for five minutes, so you also you can. Okay, maybe I start in five minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. So we start in uh, six uh, six very much, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome back to the second part of my lecture. Um, so in my lecture two or the second part, I'll be focusing on. Again, multi-scale modeling technology, but for a different attributes. Here we are interested to design the lightweight materials. Okay, we'll be interested to design lightweight home materials for aerospace, automotive, uh, marine, uh, civil, different applications. And again, we'll be looking at the challenges this material architecture, the material hierarchical structure gives us or, or provides us and how can we can use effectively a multi-scale modeling to deal with those challenges. So that would be kind of uh, the focus uh, for, for, for the next part of the talk. So, uh, so let us see how we can use multi-scale modeling for analyzing uh, and assessing and evaluating and developing lightweight materials. So let me uh, share my screen to be able to do that. Share. Okay, so you should be able to see uh, my screen uh, fairly shortly. Yep, okay. Yes. So uh, the lecture focus is multi-scale probabilistic analysis for evaluating micromechanical failure behavior of closed cell foam, uh, which is a cellular materials very often used as, a, as an alternative material for lightweight structural design. Uh, for use in composite, particularly sandwich composites, whether we have two phase sheets and in between the phase sheet you insert forms, okay? Um, so it's a very common material. Uh, so the mainly the work was done between RMIT University uh, uh, in my group, simulation of advanced materials and structure. This is the, uh, I'm leading this group here and with University of Auckland um, where my coworkers was my PhD student, uh, Dr. Yumin Ching and also Dr. Uh, Mark Batley. Uh, Yumin is now a professor in UR Institute of Technology in China, and Mark is still in Center for Advanced Composite Materials in the University of Auckland. So again, it's a New Zealand-Australia collaborative project 
uh, let's talk about this fascinating materials called foam. And you can see some of the examples where foams are used for um, sandwich structures. These are two different types of foams. You can see the face sheet, and you could see the model of a small zoomed region of a foam. And this is one would be coming more and more today for multi-scale analysis. So to outline uh, my, my talk, we'll talk about background objectives, uh, microstructure characterization, image, image based uh, models. Then we'll talk about some novel use of existing cellular models, for example, a Lagure tessellation model and Kelvin, Kelvin and Weyerfeldian models. So we can see how we could use some of the uh, very popular uh, cellular material model to describe the behavior of uh, this kind of polymeric form structures. Why we are using, as I said, lightweight means efficient. If we can reduce the weight, your car can go faster, your spaceship can fly high, your boat can go very high speed, you can have a lightweight uh, high speed bullet train, wind turbine, and of course the aircraft is the most important aspect where lightweight has value. Every kg of the weight, if you reduce in an aircraft, it is going to save you uh, many dollars in terms of flying cost and carrying capacity. So as a result, we are using lightweight materials like foams in between, normally it's used in, in sandwich structures. The sandwich structures, we have a skin. The skin normally takes inclined load and we have a core which takes the transverse shear. So the focus is, our case is the core. How can we design a better, first of all, how can we analyze the deformation and damage and failure of the core? And how can we design, uh, uh, when we analyze, we will know what are the main factors or key factors which affect uh, the core uh, failure resistance and, and damage mechanics. So we will be able to design uh, foam materials with, uh, with more stiffness, which are stiffer and which are stronger. And we're, as a result, which will be able to contribute to the sandwich structure more significantly. Because as you know, when the sandwich structure fails, often the skin doesn't fail. It is, you can get the typical uh, foam shear. Now in the foam, there are a lot of advantages from foam core. You can provide thermal and acoustic insulation, moisture, easy processing. Uh, particularly we have uh, definitely two categories of foam open cell and, and closed cell. Now our interest focused on closed cell because we can design them to be stiffer and stronger. And, and so the two things to be uh, monitoring now in my talk, cell structure and the base material. So the base material could be anything for foam. If you use metal, you get metallic foam. If you use ceramic, you can get ceramic foam, but we are focusing on polymeric foam in this case, which is the most lightweight material. So again, our focus is the core failure. You can see the shear failure, which are characterized by this kind of diagonal failure mode, or you can see the core can fail in compression. So uh, this is core failure under a complex stress state. You can see the failure response of the core, which is fairly complex because you have a screw in the, in the, in the composite, which creates a triaxial stress state you can get a more complex mode. So normally shear or compression, but you can also obtain very complex style shear stress state. So like I showed you previously for the natural fiber composite model for foam, the first step for us is to understand the damage mechanism, the physical processes behind failure and how, how important the structure of the foam at the micro scale interacts with those failure process zone. So this is a, so what we always, I like to develop models which are based on real observed physics because then there's a less chance that you can go wrong, okay? Um, so we need to understand the constitutive properties very well at the micro scale at the foam cell level. So we are talking about foam being a cellular material. That means we need to focus, zoom in our camera, to the cells and to see what happens at the cell level. And then uh, we can analyze the failure response of the whole core, which then come from the cell level. And then 
we'll hopefully be able to predict the sandwich structures. Let's now look at three types of testing of a sandwich, compression, shear, and flexure or bending. And the issue is this testing, in the compressive testing, we have used a DIC or digital image correlation to capture the strain field. And from the strain field, we can easily detect where the damage has occurred. Because if there is a damage, you will get a very high strain, right? Damage, a localized damage means a localized loss of stiffness, which means a localized high strain response. So we did compression test and you can see the high strain which shows the crushing of the fold. You can see the shear testing. We can see a nice shear stress distribution in the material, uh, very standard. And this is a flexural test. We can see very high stress in the middle of the foam core and stress decreases from the core. A foam core to the face sheets. Now the limitation is the local property of the foam varies from point to point and after the foam yields, the polymer suffers yielding, how do we, how do we model the post yield deformation behavior, particularly if it is under complex testing? Okay, that's the key thing. That tells us, that's the first part, we are trying to address through experimental testing these factors. Then, macroscopically, we want to understand the causes for macroscopic response and the relationship of foam properties to its microstructure and the base material. Now, if you look at some of the results which are available in the literature, we find this is the shear strength on density plot for three foams. And you can see uh, this is the compression strength versus density plot for three forms. So you could see for some forms like M200, M130, the shear strength is quite high. The specific shear strength is quite high, but the compression strength is not that high. Whereas M80 gives us both good compression strength, but not that high, shear specific shear strength. Second point is, so this is a thing, for the same class of foam, which is a polyurethane foam, based on the manufacturing process and the foam specification, the properties could vary. So variability is an issue in foam as well. Although this foam is not a natural materials, it is not a natural fiber like we saw last time, but it is still has got as embedded variability uh, depending on the foam. And what causes the variability? because the best material is polyurethane, PU. So what is causing the variability here? Everyone, you can guess, not the fiber property or anything. It is the material architecture or the microstructure of the forms. Secondly, many forms we can see, this is a deflection versus load diagram for a given form with different test speed. And you can see strain rate dependency. For a low strain rate, the strain foam doesn't depend on the strain rate, but for high strain rate, say 540 millimeter per second or 360 millimeter per second, you can see uh, the, um, the stiffness changes and the strength drops as well. So the foam fails at a higher strain, but at a lower load. So that means the strain drops and you get a larger plateau region for the foam. So these are the factors, the variability in specific properties, and sometimes the strain rate dependency is we need to take into account in our model, plus the failure mechanics at the microstructure scale. So that's, these are the important factors we will talk about. So how we moved about getting a micromechanical model, you have to understand at this scale, if you zoom into a form, a form is, not homogeneous, it is heterogeneous. Although we often describe foam as an isotropic material, and in, if you buy foam from a company, they will give you a data sheet with the Young's modulus, with the strength, the standard mechanical properties, but in real life, it is a heterogeneous material. What we did, we incorporated the foam structure and constituent material properties 
created a computational homogenization tool to predict the macroscopic response. So this is to complement experimental testing, to correlate experimental data with the homogenized model data, to calibrate that. That was the first thing. So we want to find the relationship of microscopic properties to microstructure and constituent properties. So if we can relate the microscopic properties with microstructure and constituents, we'll be able to characterize deformation and failure mechanisms at the micro scale. So before we start our model, we looked at what models are there in the literature and we found these models like cubic model, Kelvin model, Voronoi tessellation models. These are, the cubic model is the simplest. Kelvin model is more complex, it is uses the octahedral surface to model a closed shell form, whereas the Voronoi model is more general and it, it's more robust. Our issues was there was variability in four microstructures. So if we use one of these and use periodic condition to model a whole form, that is a very simple idealization of a real form microstructure. Because of the variability in form microstructure, will not be incorporated and the shear response cannot be captured. So these are the two issues or two difficulties or two limitations if we use standard idealized cell model for the forms. So that brings us to the objective was we wanted to quantify the microstructural variability in real form so that we can develop more accurate predictive micro model using multi-scale probabilistic modeling, and using that, we can find relationship of four macroscopic response to microstructures and properties of base material. Finally, we'll be able to characterize deformation and failure mechanism. So let us look at microstructure characterization part. We have used two different types of foam, two different varieties of PVC foam and sand foam, and these are the properties from the data sheet which manufacturer gives you. And you can see significant variability in Young's modulus, in density, in compressive strength, shear modulus, and shear strength. These forms are commercial forms. They're widely used in boats, wind turbines, and in Australia, lightweight, uh, next generation high speed trains with such variable properties given by the manufacturers. So PVC is obviously polyvinyl chloride and SAN is sarin actonide type. So we did microscopy. We used uh, a CT scanner and we create a cylindrical specimen of these different forms. And we scanned the form to create a 3D reconstruction because we want to understand what, how the microstructure changes throughout the form and what is the size of each cell? What is the size of these cells we can see and how this cell size varies. You can see the variability from point to point. That is I was talking about. What is the thickness of these cell walls? I want to understand. I want to you know, characterize. So to do that, we have taken a specimen and we have done a CT scan in three different locations. The top part, which is this part, the middle part, which is this part, and then the bottom part. And the total length, the total height of the specimen was 20 millimeter and the diameter was 10 millimeters. So a very small sample we have taken from different parts of the foam. And, and a very high resolution CT scan told us this kind of variability between sand foam and PVC. And now you can understand why we get these different properties when we test sand foam and PVC foam very large cell size, more variability in cell size, small, large, very small. Here, the cell size is more or less uniform, but there is still variability in here as well. Then there is an issue with cell wall thickness. So this is each cell, foam cell. Uh, this is the cell size. We characterize by a characteristic a diameter D. And then for each cell, the thickness of the wall is the thickness of the cell wall. So we thought these two factors, cell wall thickness and cell size, 
and how these two factors vary within a form basically controls the micro scale architecture and as a result, the macro scale properties. And we want to understand at multi scale level how these two variables affect mm, the micro scale variables, form cell size and cell wall thickness, and not only the size and thickness, they vary. So we have to characterize the variability as well. So how they vary with, within the form. So we have a value, D varies, D values at different cells and how this varies. We have a cell thickness values and how it varies. And then we want to link it with macro properties. So we can see a 3D virtual model of a 20 millimeter height, 10 millimeter diamond specimen. Looking through it is, you can characterize the cell structure in 3D, which is a very complicated structure at that scale. So we move on from here to see what we do. So what we do, we constructed this number of CT image and we use this CT image stack to create this kind of uh, 2D images in different planes. So both the horizontal plane, you can see the red color and also in the vertical plane. And we combine these images at different sections to understand a raw image then we processed it using image processing to enhance the image. So this is the same image, raw and processed. And you can clearly see the cell wall thickness, cell wall, cell size. You can, if we can, we have to do an approximation uh, to model this as a circle or best, and then get the diameter and the thickness of the wall and this kind of plateau joints. So how do we deal with these joints? These are not cell wall, cell size. So we have to incorporate this kind of uh, the joints between the adjoining region or the common point of intersection between adjacent cells. We did relative density measurement. So we took a small piece from the cell. This is the close up. And we measured the relative density means the form density divided by the best material density. So how much material you actually have, the white part, compared to the entire box. So basically the area of the box is the base material density. Uh, and this is the area of actually the form area. So we calculated the volume fraction or relative density of the form. And the percentage of the white pixel gives us the electric density. So we took this kind of slice from many places to characterize the relative density so we can statistically create a plot. And then we use this 3D image stack in different planes to create a 3D volume image or voxel-based image. How do you get cell size? Number of voxels in a cell is the cell size. Cell wall thickness, if you get number of white, white voxels across wall thickness. So basically, you calculate how many voxels are there, one, two, and you know the voxel size. So you add them, this becomes your cell wall thickness. Here we have one, two, three. So three voxel gives you cell wall thickness. And how do you get the cell size? Number of voxels in a cell. So if you want to get the size in the cell, how many voxels are there, you count. So this is voxelized, that will give you the cell size. And this is all done automatically. So using the 3D image, you calculate what we call cell size and cell wall thickness measurement, and then we can plot them. So this is, you can see for different forms, we plot along the height, H, the relative density. So for M80, the relative density does not change much with height. For M30, 134, you can see the relative density is 0.13, but at the top, it changes. C, it normally same. C70, it also changes. One value, another value, another value. And why you have got gap in this? This gap is due to the fact that we only scanned a portion in the top, a portion in the middle, a portion in the bottom, bottom of the form sample. We did not scan this space to limit 
the scanning efficiency to get quick data because it's a high resolution CT scan. So we could only scan uh, certain areas. So it shows important thing, relative density can vary like you see and why it varies along the height because this is to do with the manufacturing of the foam. So when the chemical is put in a foam jar in vessel and they are uh, processed, the chemicals are processed to form the foam, the rise direction, the direction it, which foam is formed, it creates a different properties. But that property should be taken into account in our model. So we want to make sure the measured relative density agreed well with the actual values and the relative density variations were very small. So this was the relative density profile we have plotted. Uh, this is cell size with height, cell, cell size with height for two different forms. And if we have characterized the average cell size increases along the height, so you can see for M80 form, average cell size does not change with height from M180. So different form have got different uh, height values, sorry, different form have got different cell size variation along the height on, a, on an average way. Similarly, wall thickness increases along the Y for M80. The wall thickness is smaller in the top position. So you can see the cell wall thickness changes because again, it is to do with the, how the foam is processed and manufactured. So you put the chemical in a vessel and the foam is risen from the bottom to top. So the top part has a, a, a higher wall thickness for M80. The bottom part has a lower wall thickness for M80. But for M130 foam, it is reverse. So top part has a lower thickness. The bottom part has got slightly higher thickness. Um, so this is the typical variability we have characterized using detailed experiments and then which we are using for model. So this is the statistical distribution. We have statistically characterized the variability of the cell wall and cell equivalent diameter for different forms, M80 and M130. M80 is a PU form, M130 is uh, um, also a PU form. So they use the same base material. So the base polymer is same, but we use different processing techniques to get the different variability. So you can see, the cell wall thickness is a skewed distribution. The average is about, about 12. And most uh, cell wall have a thickness distribution between 6 and 20. And it is a skewed distribution in terms of frequency. Whereas the cell size, cell equivalent diameter is a more of a, a normal distribution with the average value is about, uh, about um, 600 micrometer. And it's a nice Gaussian distribution uh, uh, about the mean value. So, and for, for M, 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 M80. From M30, it was still okay. Uh, it was not a perfectly Gaussian distribution. It's more of a flat uh, distribution, but we get the similar response, similar, similar variation. So we characterize this parameter distribution and I have to be a bit faster because of the time. Then first we characterized our microstructural parameters, how the cell wall thickness and cell equivalent diameter varies in a foam specimen. And the variation could be due to the processing parameter, due to the material, or due to the foam rise direction. So in a given foam, it is not homogeneous. It could be heterogeneous. And that's why we get such kind of property variation in a foam. Then we develop image-based model. So use binary image. We use a coil mesh. We use a triangular mesh. So this is how you use the real data to create finite element model. So use the image stack from city data, you get a smooth voxelized surface, and then you come up with a finite element model with tetrahedral mesh. And this model comes from real life foam data, but this is for one image. We have to use the multiple city images to characterize the statistical variability. So small models, lead to underestimated properties. If you are not statistically incorporate the variability, the large model, if you make the model large, it is computationally inefficient. So we have to do a balance. We choose a model, you can see, we use the model half a million nodes, 1.5 million nodes, 3 million nodes. 3 million node takes about 
10 days or six to 10 days, half a million, one and a half million, three to six days, one to three days, half a million node. So at that time we used this kind of computers, which are not the super fast, um, but we just use that. So that's the com that kind of gives you a comparison. So basically the summary is, we have to do a balance between how big, how detailed the model is, how many cells we use, how many voxels we use to capture the cell wall and cell size variation data and, and how large we can make the model. If it is too large, computationally expensive, if it is too small, we are not accurately capturing the problems. So we looked at model locations and we tried to capture the variability because I told you in the top, cell wall and cell size have a different value, average value than the middle, than the bottom. So in our model, we pick some RV from the top, some from the middle, some from the bottom. So we are characterizing the whole length response of the phone. And not only that, we did the RV convergence to make sure we used different size of RVs to characterize again size effect in choosing the RV pattern in RV volume so that our results are not dependent on the RV size. So we did an RV convergence study as well. Then we again macroscopically use Abacus because then we write our multi-scale subroutines using UMAC within Abacus. Uh, the main property, the macroscopic property was elastic perfect plastic model, quadratic tetrahedral elements, and we apply basically virtual compression test, shear test with these boundary conditions. So we basically try to use a periodic boundary condition with a compression load on the top surface, the bottom surface was fixed, a shear, the bottom surface was fixed. With top surface, we apply a shear load. You can see the compression response and equivalent plastic strain of the foam. Looking at to the effectively the cell deformation of the individual shell, the failure of the cell wall, and you can see the compressive stress strain response, which is a typical linear response. Then the failure starts here, the plasticity and the stress drops. So you can see again, the compression response of the foam with an equivalent plastic strain being developing in the middle of the cells. So the cells are failing in the middle under compression crushing because they are the, that's the middle is the hollow porous region and we can get uh, the compression uh, strength, the compression stress versus compression strain curve from the model. Then we did shear. You can see the shearing of the top surface and the displacement U1 characterize the shear strain. So you can see high level of shear in the middle part of the foam cells. And you can see the whole microstructure was modeled of the foam. So to highly characterize the deformation and we can get shear strain, shear strain diagram are based on the model prediction. So again, this is the shear response, shear simulation of, of, of the foam. So we are able to develop this macroscopic uh, model based on microscopic uh, multi-scale. So two-scale model, this is not three-scale, two-scale, macroscopic and microscopic. Microscopic model takes care of the RVE, which uh, uh, incorporates the foam cell size and foam cell wall thickness and the material property of the polymer. And the macroscopic model simulates multiple cells like a foam specimen or a foam structure, basically. And we want to find these curves. The second part was to, to characterize the size effect, which we did. You can see if you use the RV of, of 2.4 or 0.18, uh, you can see they are coincident. And if you're using the RV uh, shear stress versus shear strain diagram, 125, you get a consistent response. So we did uh, an RV size effect study for both the compressive stress, compressive strain, and shear stress, shear strain diagram, we found if RV size is greater than about five cells for compression and four cells for shear, we get the convergence. Then we studied the location effect. We found if we take the RV from the top, middle, and bottom, how the compressive stress strain and shear stress response changes. As you can see, the top section, you have a, a lower shear stiffness and uh, and then the bottom, bottom, and then the middle and bottom section. And you can see for the middle section, you have the lowest strength. This fails earlier than 
at the bottom section. So these are all exhibited macroscopically, but the effect is due to the cell wall and cell size variation microscopically. This is what we are trying to understand so that we can design better form. So these are the result variation. You can see at the compressive modulus we calculated based on uh, this predict our prediction. So shear st stress shear strain diagram, compressive strain compressive stress diagram. So this is the compressive modulus, and this is the compressive strength. This is the shear modulus, and this is the shear strength. And we compare that with the data set. So you can see this is a data set value, and our prediction with bottom, middle, top are very close for the compressive modulus. Same, the shear modulus. We are very close to the data set value at different locations. And we can also see the variation of the compressive modulus between three different sections. So you can see, we can see a low shear modulus in the top section, as you see in this case. So this is the low shear modulus, as you see for the top section in this, in this diagram. Shear strength, however, was less affected by the location of the foam, location of the RV or the location of where we take the foam sample from, a uh, very consistent strength. Uh, the model predicted a bit over predicted strength compared to the data set. Again, uh, for, uh, for shear strength, uh, you can see compressive strength and shear strength, they tally very well with the data sheet, but we do get some variation based on the location of the, of, of the foam where we take from top, middle, or bottom. Next, we look at the failure mechanisms. We can see uh, we are monitoring, we can take a point in the foam, a point A, so which is uh, this graph. We look at the compressive stress, compressive strain graph, and we focus in the point A, which is the linear region, the elastic region, and we look at the plastic strain. And then we look at the outer plane displacement, at point A, and what we can see, the failure mechanism here is mostly buckling. Cell wall buckling dominates, and that is captured in the model. We can see the plastic deformation starts in at point A. Although the global model is still linear, so it's an elastic response globally, the macro, macro scale, but micro scale, we can see the localized plastic deformation already kicks in. So that shows the localized plastic deformation starts earlier than uh, and affects later and exhibited later in the global model. So if you look at point B now, which we look at, you can see a uh, lots of areas suffer plastic deformation and plastic strain is quite high. And then the macro behavior deviates from the linear elastic behavior to plastic behavior and nonlinear behavior. So you can see point C here, significant large zones of plastic deformation in the closed cell foams. And finally at point D, the foam actually fails. Again, if we are looking at uh, the displacement, you can see the out of displacement showing buckling. So these are localized buckling, which is happening within the foam, but that is not captured in the elastic stage. But if you look at, so this is the compressive strain, Strain. And this is the shear response, shear strain versus shear stress. Shear stress, shear strain, we can see, although the bulk response is elastic, we can see out of plane uh, displacement showing buckling, localized buckling at different parts of the foam. And again, we can see the plastic deformation and buckling. So what we can see for shear and compression, there is a two different failure mechanisms at the micro scale, which compete and which exhibits as a macroscopic response. So two mechanisms are mainly for the foam, plastic deformation, which is happens by compression, but also happens uh, somewhat by shear also, but less. In shear, uh, plastic deformation, number one, number two is the buckling, localized buckling. So localized plastic deformation, localized buckling, these two mechanisms interfere. For compression, plastic deformation is highly dominant and less buckling. 
For shear, buckling is more dominant and less plastic deformation. And globally, we get this global behavior of the macroscopic response. So we completed our understanding this way. Failure happens at point B. You can see the high level of plastic deformation due to shear stress. Shear stress exceeds the plastic shear, the plastic shear strength. And we can see out of plane region, a lot, few regions of localized buckling. So both of them contributing to the failure of a macroscopic foam sample. Finally, I don't have much time. I'll, so far, we have characterized the deformation mode between micro and macro scale by characterizing real foam sample through statistical distribution and probabilistic distribution. And we use that probability distribution to create our FE model using the probabilistic data. And we have been able to understand the deformation behavior we have been able to predict the deformation behavior and failure behavior of such forms. Finally, we can now see, based on our data, can we apply the common model, such as Lagarde tessellations or Kelvin or Weyerfeld model to analyze our form. So if we can construct a Voronoi tessellation, you can see, uh, you can construct a form geometry using Voronoi tessellation or Lagarde tessellation, which use different mathematical algorithms. And if the centers of the random closed this fact spheres are taken as seed points and the radius at weights, the result, resultant Lagarde tessellation will have cells of size distribution, same as the sphere, okay? So this is a typical way we construct a Lagarde tessellation creation. So this is a conventional form model, which we are trying to modify to fit and understand a real form where we have the variability cell wall variability and cell size variability. So you could see how we have created the Lagarde cellular model from, so this model uses, so normally this is not an ideal model. All spheres will be same in an ideal model, but it uses the cells equivalent diameter distribution, which we have characterized from experimental data and converted to a statistical distribution, a probability distribution we use this probability distribution to, con to construct this Lagarde tessellation model, convert this to FEM model, mesh it and analyze. And in that FEM model, we also input the cell size and cell diameter, both goes to. So these FEM models, it uses Lagarde tessellation, but it is based on real life probability distribution of microparameters, cell diameters and cell wall thickness. And you can see, this is the compressive stress we have done with uh, Lagarde tessell tessellation model. And you can see the compressive response of the foam with severe plastic deformation. And you can see compressive stress strain response, a linear part, then of course it fails and it goes through the uh, plastic deformation. But in this case, uh, the large plastic deformation uh, can be seen within the foam. So you could see the large scale plastic deformation from the compressive stress simulation. Yes, we did the CS simulation. You can see, again, the large scale plastic deformation due to shear. And this is a shear stress and curve we obtained. This is a linear part, and this is the collapse part, where the cell actually collapse, and you get a plateau region. So both cases, we are, we are able to obtain this plateau region using our uh, simulation. Finally, the results, you can see the Lagarde model how the Lagarde model compares with the compressive modulus and shear modulus and compressive strength and shear strength uh, with the data sheet. Of course, the Lagarde model is not very good. You can see the deviation with the data sheet could be quite significant in terms of modulus. Uh, and the strength is not that bad. Uh, strength predicts well, but the modulus doesn't predict well. 20% lower than data sheet. Why? Because there is a deficiency in Lagarde model, which that's why it is not very good. And that's why we, we can use it, but we have to understand it is an approximation because it does not take into account curved cell walls. You can see the curvature, double counts the cell wall. This is counted in this cell and this cell. The plateau border, this one. And sometimes it uses shell elements. So this cannot simulate exactly and capture the modulus well. That's why, 
our model, our multi-scale model is better than the Lagarde tessellation model. So I have solved the problem using multi-scale model first, micro macro model, and then we have solved the same problem with Lagarde tessellation model to show, even, even if you use experimental data and probabilistic data for the micro parameter into the Lagarde tessellation model, it is okay, not a bad model, but it cannot still predict the modulus that well because of these limitations. Then what we predicted, we identified the variability coefficient. That is a new concept. See, the variation of Young's modulus and shear modulus. So this is the ratio, okay? A ratio of the Young's modulus of the foam where there is no variability. So sigma one equal to zero to the Young's modulus of the foam where there's a variability parameter. This characterizes how cell size varies, how cell wall thickness varies and how it affects the Young's modulus, shear modulus, compressive strength, and shear strength. You can see modulus is very sensitive. If your cell size varies, the modulus drops very quickly. It becomes from its original modulus to nearly 10% loss. For shear modulus, uh, for, uh, for shear wall thickness, so shear size, cell size variation can drop the modulus by 10%, whereas cell wall thickness variation can drop the modulus by nearly 30%. So this is what, why the real form differs. The real form property differs from the ideal model because this variability in cell size and cell wall thickness are not taken into account. Strength is less affected. Compressive strength, shear strength for cell size variation uh, is, is less affected uh, by uh, by, by cell size variation. But again, if the cell wall thickness varies significantly, you can see the drop in strength, significant. So cell wall affects the modulus and also the strength drop significantly. This is the full strength. If you have a uniform cell wall thickness, okay? This is the strength if the cell wall thickness varies with a variability coefficient of 0.8. So you can see, the summary is cell wall thickness variation causes significant drop in strength and stiffness. Cell size variation affects the stiffness, the modulus some extent, but it doesn't affect the strength that much. And that has to do with the mechanism of deformation. So you can see Lagarde model with uniform cell size and cell wall thickness. This is the uniform cell size, our best model. And this is the Lagarde model with uniform cell wall but non-uniform cell size. So we are isolating the effect of cell size variation on the failure mechanics. And why it happens, as the cell size become dispersed, plastic deformation tends to localize at the ends of the Lagarde model. So you could see uniform cell wall, but non-uniform cell size, okay? So cell size is non-uniform, cell wall is uniform. Here, non-uniform cell size and cell wall thickness, you can see localized plastic, uh, localized buckling, which causes the early failure things. So as cell wall thickness becomes more dispersed, more, more variable, we can see more cell wall will buckle during the elastic compression and shear, and that will cause failure. So cell wall thickness variation cause buckling, which leads to the drop in modulus and strength, whereas cell size variation cause more plastic deformation, which tends to localize and causes the loss of strength. So two different microparameters, cell size and cell wall, affects the plastic deformation into different ways. Then we looked at a Kelvin and Weir model, like a Lagarde model. We constructed the uh, same thing, a normalized compressive strength versus relative density, normalized shear strength, relative density, looked at how the weir fellin model and Kelvin form predicts uh, with the variability. So the low density spectrum, strength increases quadratically with relative density. At high density spectrum, the strength increases linearly with relative density. So we have done this more detailed analysis with the Kelvin model as well, which concludes our finding that if you want to apply idealized form model to analyze forms, it is not accurate, and you have to use the real experimental data to develop better accurate predictive model. But if you use the multi-scale model, that is the best model, which can exactly capture 
the microscale uh, effect, the microscale mechanics, deformation and failure mechanics, and can accurately predict the macroscopic behavior in terms of modulus and in terms of strength. So that's basically, I conclude, what we found, relative density cell size and cell wall thickness vary along the thickness of sand foam. More homogeneous the cell size and cell wall thickness are, the better properties. So homogeneity, uniformity gives you better properties. Cell wall thickness is the main factor that leads to reduced strength. The wear filament structure provides the highest compressive properties in terms of the ideal model. The foam shear properties do not display much shell shape dependency. So shear doesn't depend, uh, depend much on the cell shape. We have used image-based model, which show high accuracy, but they are computationally expensive. So Lagorde models display reasonable accuracy. So you can use image-based multi-scale model, which we did. They are very accurate, but computationally expensive. You can use as an alternative, some Lagorde model, which will display reasonable accuracy and well-suited for property microstructural study. So low relative density cell size, cell wall thickness result in buckling. So if you have a low relative density cell wall and cell wall and cell size and cell wall thickness variation can result in local buckling, and that creates a nonlinear relationship between compressive strength and density. Buckling occurs in shear and minor effect on foam strength. So these are kind of our key contribution uh, from this work, which was published in a number of papers. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, significance. So from manufacturers, they can use the model to get optimal from microstructures. They can use our model to study the effect of microstructure characterization, and they can predict the theoretically maximum properties using our model. From foam researchers like we guys, you can use image-based model and laggard model and understand the failure uh, mechanics in great details. And foam users like companies, when sand foam are used, 10% less properties need to be assigned to the foam. So you have to have a 10% margin because the cell size variation decreases the effective properties by 10%. So be aware of the property variation across the thickness of the foam due to the foam rise direction, okay? Shear properties need to be used carefully. They are quite linear to the relative density. And normally we should pick high density foam because high density foam will be lower the buckling pattern. So that's basically, this work will provide the theoretical bounds for a foam so they can assess the quality of the foam. So these are the number of publications we published, Journal of Composite Materials, International Journal of Solids and Structures, Journal of Applied Mechanics, which is, um, uh, which is a quite a well-known journal uh, in transactions of ASME, uh, Composite Structures, uh, International Journal of Engineering Science and Thin Wall Structures. So these are uh, some of the key papers and there are more. Uh, some of the conferences we presented, or WCCM, uh, International Conference on Computational Mechanics and also ICCCM, our work. Final message in my, when I finish my lecture, all these PhD students who are here, listen to me. All models are wrong. I'm a modeler. I love computational modeling. I love theoretical modeling. I love mathematical modeling. But I know the models I'm developing are wrong. All models are wrong. No model can predict the reality correctly. But some are useful. OK? So this is the message I, I will give you to you guys when you do your own research. Why? These are the reasons. In models, there are known knowns, like we know material properties. We know some input values. They are good things. But the important thing is there are known unknowns. So we know what we don't know. Sometimes we do not know interface property correctly. Sometimes we don't know microstructural variations correctly. We don't have the characteristic input data. And we try to make assumptions and approximations and try to create a model which is based on not good quality input data. Okay, input parameters are missing. We do a lot of sensitivity study and so on and so forth. To my view, it is not adequate. So we are exploring known unknowns. But even if you tick box known known and known unknown, what you can't deal with is unknown unknowns, which we don't know what we don't know. And that is the challenge for modelers. What is that we are missing in the model? We sometimes don't know. And that causes the model ineffectiveness, uh, accuracy issues, 
uh, and why the models don't work in some cases. Again, to finish up, thanks to my collaborators and students, funding from different agencies, particularly my thanks goes to Professor Patricia Tuvalosi and uh, her group, uh, Professor Anna Maria Pau, Dr. Nicholas Fantuzzi and Dr. Michael Pingaro, and all the students and staff in Department of Structural and Geotechnical Engineering for inviting me to participate in this research. So thank you very much. My next step with you guys is how can we collaborate? I'm here, I was meant to go to Italy uh, to work with all of you or some of you who have an interest in our work, uh, but hopefully I, 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 I will try to be there next year uh, with the visiting fellowship, but we, I look forward to start some collaboration even from here, because a lot of things we can do virtually, which we can't, uh, which uh, we don't need to be face to face, okay? So thanks uh, for your attention. Thank you very much. And many thanks to my groups at different stages. You can see a lot of my students here. Uh, uh, I used to have quite a number of students. You can see a lot of French interns. So a lot of students used to come from France. Uh, this is a picture taken at the conference in New Zealand where Professor Patricia came. And, and this is my beautiful city of Melbourne, which I welcome you. I invite all of you to come and enjoy uh, when our lockdown is over, when we have a better world. Uh, so this is the most livable city, Australia's intellectual hub. You can get very nice food, uh, exceptional uh, hospitality, great coffee, and major events like Wimbledon uh, happens in Melbourne. Uh, so you can, you can watch a grand stamp and some tennis if you come here, okay? If you like to spend all your money in shopping, like many Italians like to do, we have lots of shops, don't worry. A lots of indigenous culture and lots of things to do in Melbourne city. Uh, you can see some of the pictures, our museum, art gallery, botanical garden, and, and fantastic city to enjoy. Many side trips in Victoria, you can watch penguins, Phillip Island, Great Ocean Road, Mornington Peninsula is famous for wine and Ear Valley is famous for wine as well. So if you like Italian wine, so you can compete Italian wine versus Australian wine uh, when you come to Melbourne, okay? We make also good wine, okay? Uh, so, um, so anyway, so this is a picture from Great Ocean Road and what I want to show, the multi-scale fracture in rocks because you are a geotechnical department, right? So you are more interested in geotechnical materials. And this is a picture is taken in 12 Apostles in Victoria, which is about three hours from Melbourne. And you can see the striations and layered fracture and beautiful large scale fracture patterns. And if you are more interested in geomechanics, you are very welcome. You can spend a lovely day here and do your research at the same time. Finally, I would like to conclude uh, with a small memory with a, uh, your group leader, Professor Patricia. Uh, this was uh, when I visited in Rome in the last ICCCM conference. Okay, um, so thank you very much. Uh, ciao and have a wonderful uh, evening. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Sorry, I took a bit more time, but hopefully, hopefully I can answer any question if there is any question. Thank you again, bye. And uh, please send me the picture that I, I don't remember where I put it of this. Sure, sure, because you are the, you are the, because thank you, thank you for giving me the award. Okay. Um, I see that in your uh, team, there are only two women, isn't it? Uh, now there are more, but uh, previous, previously two. there was none. Only two. Only two, yeah. 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 Now there's more, yeah. <laughs> so there is need to increase uh, the pink uh, um, yeah. in your group. Exactly. Okay. I, I, I absolutely agree. Okay. Um, I think that we are... Uh, a little bit over the time, but uh, if uh, there are uh, still uh, some questions, please please ask, Professor. Any question, uh, please ask. Professor otherwise, Dasha, you... who is going to have a new dinner? 
with the pizza ah. and uh, something else. I don't know. Pizza, uh, pizza and lasagna, lasagna. And and no, if no, I no, still no. remember, uh, in, 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 in Italy, uh, if you go to Naples, you can get this cheese, which is the buffalo cheese, which is very famous. I love it. We are waiting for you. And uh, uh, Bufa, it, it's, it's called Buffa con buffalo, Buffa. Buffa cheese. Buffa, Buffa cheese. We will uh, give you a short seminar on this topic uh, when you will arrive. And, sure. uh, are there other questions? Maji, do you want to intervene again? And you can always ask me question. Uh, my email is given. So I will put my email in the chat or you can type my name in Google. You'll find me and you can ask me any uh, yes. question anytime. Yes, yes. I, uh, at the end of the course, uh, I will ask uh, all the lecturers to send the uh, PDF of the presentation to yeah, share with yeah. our students. And uh, I will also ask you if you agree to uh, spread in to the our to our students uh, only the also the registrations of the talk. Yeah, but, uh, sure, sure. I will contact you at the end of the course. Thank you again, sure. Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you, Professor, for the lecture. Bye, everybody. Ciao. Bye, Professor. Thank you. contribution uh, in the first order computational homogenization. So in our excursus, we are uh, first considering first order computational homogenization. This uh, picture you can see here is uh, borrowed from uh, this uh, paper. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, a schematic representation uh, uh, that um, uh, is uh, underlying this approach. So uh, we consider a macroscopic continuum. So uh, the, at the, the so the our um, structure. So at the macroscopic level, and uh, in we uh, consider at each material point of this macroscopic continuum that uh, is uh, um, by assumption uh, homogeneous continuum equivalent to the microscopic one. So at each macroscopic sampling point, we can... Uh, just a second, sorry. There is a problem here in... Uh, Non è slide, non come si Forse attiva quella finestra perché qua mi ricordiamo questa visualizzazione. Forse sotto? No. Qua, 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 vai. Ecco, questo, 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 questo qua. One minute more, sorry, but we are experiencing a problem. <laughs> Technical. Okay, it seems solved. No problem. Okay, so. Um, at each macroscopic uh, 
material point, so each sampling point, we can go back, we can um, uh, imagine to uh, zoom in at this level and see uh, a uh, heterogeneous microstructure uh, that is uh, directly uh, related to uh, the macroscopic point. And uh, from this level, we can extract, we can grasp uh, important information in terms of stress and strains that uh, um, we can send back to the macroscopic level and uh, that are useful to, uh, um, to uh, give um, the uh, constitutive response at the macroscopic level for which we don't know a closed form uh, constitutive law. So um, we consider uh, a typical heterogeneous RV. So in the sense uh, of uh, the representative volume element that we discussed yesterday uh, following the definition by Hill. And uh, uh, the idea is that, uh, as I said before, from this RV, we can estimate the um, equivalent homogeneous uh, properties uh, at the macroscopic level uh, by applying, uh, by, um, uh, applying on the RV properly defined boundary condition, conditions. And uh, in addition, we can see that at the microscopic level, the heterogeneous RV can be uh, also uh, described by a homogeneous continuous RV without voids or rigid particles. Uh, so we can also at the microscopic level define an equivalent uh, homogeneous medium. This means that the continuous properties at the macroscopic sampling point um, can be described by the microscopic homogeneous continuous RV. And uh, by exploiting the Hill's lemma that we uh, see in the next slide, we can impose uh, the fulfillment of the satisfaction of an energy equivalent condition between the sampling point at the macroscopic continuum and the uh, volume of uh, the uh, RV. Uh, this means that the exchange of information between the two levels in terms of stress and strains um, is uh, uh, performed um, by assuming that there is an, equi an, an energy equivalence uh, between the two levels. Um, this is the main import, the, the, the most important uh, principle uh, that uh, must be uh, fulfilled in order to exploit the uh, homogenization uh, schemes. So, uh, with this in mind, we mm, consider a, a classical continuum uh, model uh, for both the macroscopic and the microscopic level. Here, uh, very um, uh, uh, simply, uh, the equations uh, uh, governing the equilibrium stress and the deformation fields in the RDE are given in terms of uh, the stress tensor sigma and the strain tensor epsilon. That is uh, the symmetric part of the displacement gradients. So uh, these relations, sigma ij, comma, comma i uh, equal zero, so the uh, equilibrium in absence of body forces um, is valid in each point of the RVE as well as the uh, deformation uh, epsilon ej 
here the comma is uh, uh, a misplit, sorry, epsilon ej, uh, the deformation is defined at each point of the RV. So besides these equations, um, uh, the equilibrium of uh, traction uh, uh, of the traction TE is fulfilled on the surface of the RV where N uh, R is the vector of the outward normal. And we can um, exploit the uh, definition of uh, average field theory for both uh, sigma EJ and epsilon EJ. So um, we can, uh, uh, in, in, uh, without distinction, define the average with uh, an overbar or with these uh, brackets. And the definition is exactly the same as we said before. So uh, the average of, of uh, the stresses at the microscopic level is uh, the weighted uh, integral of uh, sigma ij in each point of the, of the RV uh, divided, so weighted on uh, the, uh, the volume of the RV. So uh, the same for uh, the same the same applies for epsilon ej. Um, by uh, mm, applying some uh, manipulations, uh, by performing some uh, manipulations, it is possible to uh, transform these two volume integrals into surface integrals. These definitions are, if you remember, exactly the same uh, given by Hill in, uh, in his uh, uh, seminal work. Uh, so uh, the average of the stresses within the, uh, the RBE can be um, evaluated just uh, on the boundaries if you know the tractions along the boundaries and uh, for the deformation the average value of the deformations uh, within the rv can be evaluated uh, just uh, knowing uh, the uh, displacement uh, vector along the boundaries of the rv at this point um, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, introduce uh, the uh, very uh, famous Hill's lemma. That is uh, a lemma that descends from uh, the work by Hill uh, considered yesterday. So um, for any stress and strain field, uh, sigma ij and epsilon ij, uh, at a given point of the RV under prescribed boundary traction or prescribed displacement conditions, one has the following result. So um, the uh, Hill's lemma states that if you average the product of uh, stress and strains, so the integral over the volume of the product sigma ij by epsilon ij and subtract to this uh, the product of the averages, uh, so uh, obtained by averaging uh, separately the stress and the strain uh, tensors, this uh, difference equals the integral over S, sorry, this is uh, S, so over the, uh, the boundary of the RV, uh, the integral of this product. And if you see here, you have two terms. The first term is the difference between the displacement and the value uh, of uh, uh, average deformation multiplied by the, um, the uh, 
coordinate of the point along, uh, along the boundary where you are considering the contribution to the integral, uh, multiplied by um, these, uh, these two terms. These are, these are the traction uh, in each point of uh, the boundary, and this is the product of the average stress multiplied by the outward normal. Mm. And here uh, there is uh, the definition of this term, sigma ij uh, by epsilon ij over bar uh, that I uh, uh, introduced uh, before. So um, if you consider this lemma, and here, uh, I, if you are curious, I suggest you uh, this book uh, by Ku and Chera, Cercawi, uh, where there is the proof of this lemma. Uh, I am I'm not going into details, uh, but uh, here there is uh, the, the proof of the lemma. So starting from the right hand side uh, by exploiting all the, uh, the um, uh, multiplicative terms, you can uh, end up with the definition uh, of uh, the lemma. Um, okay, so starting from the Hill-Mandel, uh, the Hill's lemma, if you apply, so just consider last time this, uh, this expression, if you apply a display over the boundary, a displacement, that is exactly equal to this kinematic map. So if you apply uh, on the uh, boundary of a 2D or a 3D uh, RVE exactly that kinematic map, the second term vanishes. And so you have this equality as a consequence of the Hill's um, lemma. Moreover, so the, this uh, is the first uh, possibility, and uh, this choice is exactly the choice of Dirichlet type boundary conditions. Um, there is another uh, possibility. The possibility is uh, applying over the boundary, uh, a, a traction, uh, uh, surface attractions that exactly fulfill these, uh, oh, but you cannot see my, my pointer. Okay, so the second, uh, the second, uh, uh, okay. Okay, so now, now it's Okay, so if you in turn apply over the boundaries, uh, surface traction that are exactly equal to the average value of sigma multiplied by the outward normal, in this case, the second term vanishes and again, you and uh, you fulfill this expression. So this choice, this choice is related to the choice of Neumann boundary condition. So the application of traction boundaries that are exactly uh, of this type. And um, as I said before, the other option is related to Dirichlet type boundary conditions. So, uh, to sum up this part, for sta statically admissible stress fields, so the fields that over the boundary fulfill this condition, or kinematically admissible displacement fields, the fields that uh, fulfill this kinematic map, the volume average of the product of sigma by epsilon is the same as the product of the volume averages uh, evaluated separately. Um, you 
can uh, note that the left hand side term is twice the value of the strain energy density. And uh, this means that the volume average averaged uh, strain energy density of heterogeneous material can be obtained by averaging separately the stresses and the strains in the uh, RD. Um, in this sense, I borrowed this sentence from the, the paper by Liu. Homogenization can be interpreted as finding a homogeneous comparison material that is energetically equivalent to a given microstructured material. So this is the key concept of the homogenization. But um, let's try to uh, better understand uh, how uh, these uh, boundary conditions are uh, uh, applied. And uh, so for, for the Cauchy uh, continuum, um, how this expression in, in this case for a 2D uh, problem, uh, how this, uh, this expression can be uh, can be um, exploited. So um, when both E and J are equal to one, this expression uh, corresponds to this first uh, set of boundary conditions. So this means that uh, if you consider we are very simple uh, square RV uh, into D, uh, this uh, corresponds to uh, applying a constant value of displacement along the vertical edges, while a linear, uh, a linear uh, uh, function uh, along, uh, along the, the uh, horizontal edges. So if you fix the value of uh, epsilon one one over bar, uh, you are able to apply these boundary conditions. Um, and here you can see uh, the um, uh, the undeformed and the formed shape of uh, uh, that that, uh, um, that are the solution of uh, the application of these boundary conditions in the case of a homogeneous material. So uh, these boundary conditions uh, applied to a homogeneous materials uh, are responsible for constant sigma one one stresses. Uh, the second, uh, the second. Uh, set of uh, boundary conditions is uh, clearly the one um, associated to E and J equal to two. So is exactly the same by, uh, by exchanging uh, vertical and horizontal edges. And you can see that uh, the deformation uh, is, uh, um, is uh, 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 prevented along the vertical edges while the uh, RV can only, uh, can only uh, 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 undergo a uniaxial uh, elongation uh, with prevented uh, restriction, lateral restriction. And this is responsible for constant uh, stresses, sigma 2 2 stress in a homogeneous uh, material. The third set of boundary conditions uh, are related to uh, E and J that are uh, equal to one and two or two and one. And so in this case, you end up with, uh, with uh, this set of boundary conditions that are uh, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the upper uh, bottom and uh, uh, bottom and top sides, uh, U1 is constant, U2 is linear. Um, in, uh, on the contrary, along the vertical uh, boundaries, U1 is linear, U2 is constant. So the, the formation, uh, associated to uh, this set of boundary condition 
is uh, the one that uh, on a uh, homogeneous RB uh, cause, uh, causes sigma one, two constant stress. Um, on the other end, we can um, here uh, represent the, uh, no, sono andata, oh, sta ri ricollegando. Ok. Non so cosa dire. Sono disconnetta per tipo un secondo. Ah, ok. Devo rifare la condivisione. Stop to a short question regarding the direct boundary condition. In, when you impose uh, the um, sort of traction, you pull in x direction in uh, y direction, mm -hmm. the Poisson uh, is, uh, you don't impose so, anything regarding the orthogonal direction. No. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, so you prevent the. You don't prevent the Poisson effect, or you prevent. You prevent the You prevent, okay. Uh, okay. And uh, uh, Neumann boundary condition, uh, conditions. So in this case, here you have the, uh, the scheme associated to the application of uh, sigma 1, 1 average. So T1 uh, surface tractions, T2 surface, surface tractions, and uh, sigma one two over by so the uh, shear uh, term so um, at this point uh, i uh, again underline that uh, the choice of the rve is uh, not a trivial uh, problem, uh, especially in the case of a random medium, because when you deal with uh, a microstructure that uh, exhibits uh, a random uh, distribution of uh, voids, inclusions of uh, heterogeneities, uh, you are not able to uh, detect uh, at the beginning uh, what portion of uh, your heterogeneous structure can be representative of the whole medium at the macroscopic uh, level. And so um, the, uh, the um, uh, identification of the RBE in such cases uh, becomes an unknown of the problem. Uh, so in uh, various, uh, uh, so there are different approaches uh, proposed in the literature to overcome this problem. One of these approaches was first proposed by uh, Stoya Sarzeski and, also, and then uh, also by Saab and uh, I, I, I with Professor Trovalusci and also Marco Pingaro also um, investigate uh, this topic, as you will see uh, in detail in a few slides. But uh, so the idea is that you, uh, you um, search for, uh, for uh, the RV sides that um, fulfill the following condition. So given a constitutive term, for example, we are searching for uh, the equivalent uh, young modulus of uh, uh, at the macroscopic point, um, we uh, uh, apply uh, Neumann uh, boundary condition and the Dirichlet boundary condition in this graph uh, in uh, green and in orange respectively. Uh, to a portion, initially a small portion, and then a bigger and bigger uh, portion, so increasing the RV sites, we search for the RV sites that uh, 
um, that uh, uh, gives us a convergence for the constitutive term that we are looking for. So uh, the uh, size of the RV is, as, as I said before, uh, itself an unknown of the problem. And uh, so th this is a topic ve uh, very uh, concerning topic and um, very debated in uh, literature. And uh, the, the material contrast, so the ratio uh, between uh, the uh, constitutive uh, properties of, uh, the, the, of, of the phases in the heterogeneous material is uh, uh, very important in order to, uh, to uh, modify uh, the uh, convergence uh, trend of the, of the Rickley type and Neumann, the Neumann type boundary conditions. A uh, different story is uh, the case of a periodic medium, because when you have a periodic medium, here these two pictures are uh, quite old, uh, date back to 1995 by Antoine. Uh, and uh, so Antoine uh, investigated in detail this problem, the problem of uh, um, uh, um, computational homogenization uh, in case of uh, masonry uh, uh, structures. So uh, the idea is that if you have here an undeformed uh, medium, uh, uh, um, uh, brick masonry uh, wall in this case, uh, when you apply a globally homogeneous stress state, due to the, uh, so th this is the undeformed uh, view, but when you apply this globally homogeneous stress state, you can see that due to the periodicity of the medium, two joined cells must still fit together in the common deformed state. This is uh, really an um, imaginative uh, picture, is uh, uh, inspired by Escher-like uh, picture. So <laughs> this is not... Uh, um, um, representative of what really happens to a brick in masonry, but I think it's very useful to understand how uh, one single brick within a periodic structure can deform. So uh, in mechanical terms, this means that when you pass from a cell to uh, another one that is uh, 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 that is joined to the first one, the stress vector is continuum, strains are compatible, and uh, we cannot uh, imagine that separation. Uh, so we, we, uh, we uh, neglect separation or overlapping. Mm, the, the observation of such uh, kind of deformation um, inspired the so-called periodic boundary condition. So the idea is that if you extract from the periodic medium one unit cell, so the one represented here, and you are able to apply boundary conditions on this unit cell that reproduce the effect of uh, of uh, uh, all the cells that are uh, uh, around the uh, unique, uh, this unique cell within a periodic medium. So uh, if you impose uh, boundary conditions such that they mimic the presence of the, uh, uh, of the medium around uh, in, in a periodic medium, you uh, will be able to uh, reproduce your medium just considering one single cell. I hope it was clear, but 
Uh, okay, uh, I think in the, in the next slide, slide it will be uh, more clear. So, uh, besides this, uh, there are two different uh, uh, definitions of periodicity. So, you can um, uh, have a medium that exhibits global periodicity, or besides this, also a medium that uh, exhibits local periodicity. Lo local periodicity. In this case, uh, each, uh, each RBE is the same. If you want to, uh, uh, if you want to reproduce at the uh, macroscopic level this medium, in this other case, uh, you will need the definition of different RBE, each one representative of a, a, a medium that is locally uh, periodic. Um, so um, this was the introdu introduction to uh, uh, the so-called periodic boundary conditions. So uh, as I said before, uh, these periodic boundary conditions uh, are such that um, the, uh, the uh, possible deformation of the single cell um, takes into account in, uh, um, in uh, uh, some mimics the presence of uh, the medium around. Um, the displacement field solution of the RVE is uh, in this case, the superposition of two terms. One term, this U star is exactly the kinematic map as we, as we have seen before. So epsilon over bar multiplied by X plus a periodic field UP that is a special displacement field that has zero average and that is responsible for uh, these, uh, 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 these uh, additional conditions uh, that mimics the presence of the uh, outer medium. So um, to prescribe periodic boundary condition over a 2D square uh, cell, uh, we have to impose exactly the kinematic map at the four vertices of the cell, while we have to impose over uh, the ages, uh, corresponding ages, such condition. So, considering, for example, the bottom and the top edge of the RVE, we say that the condition that must be fulfilled in order to reproduce this situation, so a periodic medium around the single cell, is that the difference between the displacement component in plus and minus, so in two corresponding points of the uh, of the boundary uh, must be equal to the value of the average deformation that we are applying multiplied by the difference of uh, the, uh, so the, the, the coordinate uh, uh, associated to, to the points. And this must be applied both to bottom and top ages and to left and side ages in 2D. In 3D, it's exactly the same, but uh, extended to a three-dimensional case. Uh, these um, boundary conditions are typically uh, implemented uh, using uh, Lagrange multipliers and uh, are uh, weak conditions. So we are not as uh, imposing uh, uh, prescribed values of the displacements over the ages, but we are prescribing the uh, 
the um, fulfillment of a conditions of a condition uh, that links uh, two by two all the uh, nodes of uh, all the nodes of your discretization uh, if you think at a uh, um, finite element discretization of this problem um, so um, this uh, uh, Periodic boundary conditions are uh, uh, extremely popular in literature. Are wide, have been widely used uh, in multi-scale computational homogenization uh, based on the first order Cauchy continuum. Each time uh, you can uh, describe your medium as a periodic medium. So. Uh, uh, again, the idea is that if you have a heterogeneous composite material, for example, so a generic heterogeneous um, composite material, for example, made by a matrix with embedded inclusions, uh, you uh, can uh, describe this um, uh, heterogeneous medium uh, by uh, uh, by considering an equivalent effective continuum um, for uh, each point of the equivalent uh, continuum, you can solve a, a microscopic level problem on a single cell uh, that uh, is uh, uh, is uh, um, that undergoes a kinematic map, so with prescribed kinematic map, and that fulfill periodic boundary condition, so that the solution of this boundary value problem is the superposition of the kinematic map plus a periodic medium. Note that this periodic medium vanishes when the microstructure uh, tends to uh, a homogeneous medium. So if you consider a homogeneous medium, U tilde is zero. Uh, but, in the, but when uh, heterogeneities uh, emerge, uh, this U tilde is uh, different by zero. So by solving this problem at the microscopic level, you can um, evaluate the stress state in each point and by exploiting the Hill-Mandel condition, you can extract the equivalent uh, stress, the average stress that is representative of the constitutive uh, behavior of this, this heterogeneous material at the macroscopic level. So with this approach, you, uh, you don't need to uh, introduce to uh, extract a closed form constitutive law at the macroscopic level, but the constitutive response directly emer emerges from the microstructure. Uh, this is uh, just uh, uh, the same for uh, the case of a uh, um, uh, of a masonry wall. Uh, you can uh, you can uh, um, analyze the problem at uh, different scales of interest. So uh, this problem is. Uh, inherently a multi-scale problem. And uh, with this approach, you can uh, exchange information between the structural scale and the microstructural scale by uh, imposing the kinematic map that is driven by uh, the deformation at the macroscopic level. And this, uh, this uh, uh, phase of the homogenization is uh, um, named as localization. And then you can extract the information at the microscopic scale and homogenize uh, typically the stress response in order to obtain the constitutive response averaged at the macroscopic level. So uh, just to sum up, it is exactly the same. So the idea is that you have at the macroscopic level a Cauchy continuum uh, that is uh, uh, equilibrated 
So in terms of sigma and E capital, uh, so this is the balance equation with uh, body forces. Uh, these are the uh, stress, the, the strain displacement relation and the boundary conditions uh, at the macroscopic level. At this level, you don't know the constitutive law. So each time you need to evaluate the constitutive law, you need to go back to go uh, uh, within the microscopic level and solve a problem in terms of the kinematic map uh, in which the average value is exactly the uh, strain value evaluated at the macroscopic level. So the solution of that problem will be the stress sigma capital that is uh, related to the strain applied to the boundary, uh, to, to the boundaries of the RPE. So you solve a nested boundary value problem in order to grasp the uh, response at the macroscopic level. This uh, uh, scheme is uh, um, uh, very, uh, uh, it can be uh, easily uh, implemented in a finite element scheme uh, that is uh, especially useful when at the microscopic level you have nonlinear constitutive response. Uh, so, uh, very simply, if you have uh, a structure at the macroscopic level, uh, you can uh, discretize this structure with macroscopic elements. Uh, each element is a homogeneous element, uh, and each element uh, is uh, in this in this. Uh, 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 case of a uh, Cauchy continuum uh, 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 very simple. In this case, for example, a four node uh, um, element uh, with, uh, um, for, with uh, the two degrees of freedom. E each node has two degrees of freedom of displacement and each element has four Gauss points. So the idea is that at each Gauss point, so when you uh, when you at, at the Gauss point level um, have to, uh, so in a displacement driven approach, at, at a certain point, you uh, enter in the Gauss point with a value of the deformation of the strain. And uh, by solving the constitutive law, you uh, end up with the uh, associated stress. In this case, when you enter in the um, uh, Gauss point with the deformation, you go back to the nested problem. So you um, uh, associate uh, to this Gauss point a, a mesh, a further mesh, uh, that is uh, the one that represents the unit cell, uh, that is discretized uh, with uh, finite elements. And uh, when, when you solve this finite element problem, then you average the stresses and you go back to your point at the macroscopic level. Since uh, you, know, uh, in, you know the value of the deformations at the same time at each point of the macroscopic level, uh, this um, uh, approach can be very easily uh, parallelized. So you can um, parallelize your code and you can uh, solve um, uh, at the same time different or, or all RBEs and then you uh, obtain uh, separately the, uh, the response from each uh, RBE that is associated to uh, the corresponding uh, macroscopic Gauss point. Mm. 
this approach that, as I said before, has been uh, widely used in literature. And uh, uh, you can uh, go back to my slides uh, from yesterday uh, to see the, uh, the seminal, uh, you know, the, the review papers if you want to, uh, to uh, investigate this topic, if you are curious to see uh, possible applications, both in 2D and 3D. Uh, but this, uh, so this approach, when you use Cauchy continuum at both scales, exhibits some limits. Uh, the first limit is uh, the, the fact that uh, Cauchy is a local continuum, so the uh, principle of local action. So the fact that uh, the material response at a point depends only on the conditions within an arbitrary small region around the point. And so uh, you can, uh, so each point um, cannot uh, um, see what happens uh, at a certain distance in the medium. Um, this means that this approach is valid only when the microstructure is really very small with respect to the characteristic size at the macroscopic scale. So uh, this approach uh, is valid only if uh, the principle of scale separation holds. Um, this uh, uh, definition was, uh, the, the, the definition of the principle of scale separation was uh, very well uh, investigated in this paper uh, by Zawi that I uh, mentioned yesterday as a review paper of first order computational homogenization. So um, here there is a, a very detailed description of this principle of local action. So um, I will go on in this. So uh, you can uh, distinguish in uh, a heterogeneous material five length scales in ascending order. So starting from the uh, micro-mechanical or nano-mechanical scale going up to uh, upper scales. So mu, mu zero uh, is uh, the lower length bound under which continuum mechanics is not valid anymore. And we are not going down because our, uh, our level of investigation is uh, in uh, the framework of the continuum mechanics. Mu is the characteristic size of the heterogeneities. So if you have a heterogeneous medium, for example, with particles, typically Mu is uh, the characteristic size of these uh, particles or with voids, is the same. Then L is the characteristic size of the RVE, so the, the physical dimension of the portion of your heterogeneous medium that you consider as representative of the whole structure. Then lambda is the fluctuation length of the prescribed mechanical loading at the structural level. This is also important. So uh, if you have um, loads that uh, uh, varies at the macroscopic level, uh, you will have a, a typical uh, fluctuation length scale, while uh, capital L is the characteristic size of the structure. So this principle of local action holds when L is uh, much smaller than capital L. So the size of the RD is much smaller than the size of the structure. Moreover, uh, besides this, mu, so the characteristic size of the heterogeneities must be much smaller than the size of the RD. Moreover, mu zero, so that uh, lower uh, bound uh, that we are not crossing is much smaller than mu. So the dimension of the heterogeneities is much bigger than this mu zero. And the last relation is that L is much lower 
than, much smaller than lambda. So the characteristic size of the RPE must be much smaller than the fluctuation length of the uh, loadings, of the mechanical loadings at the structural level. So if all these conditions hold, you uh, are uh, fulfilling the principle of scale separation. And so in this case, and only in this case, you can use uh, without problems, this uh, first order computational homogenization. Um, besides this, there are further limits of this first order computational homogenization. So we, uh, we have seen the first two. Now we can go to the third point. So uh, um, this uh, uh, first order computational homogenization, uh, in this case, the absolute size of the constituents does not, not affect the effective properties of the homogenized medium. Since we are dividing by the volume of the RVE, if we have the same microstructure, but uh, enlarged, so if you have a medium with uh, uh, the first microstructure and you have a medium with the second one that is exactly the same with the same material, but uh, um, um, mag magnified by a given uh, uh, value, this um, type of uh, homogenization is not able to uh, give a different value because you are averaging over the volume and dividing, dividing by the volume. And so um, this can be a drawback in uh, some cases, as we can see uh, in a uh, few slides. Um, another drawback is that you, uh, if you, if you uh, focus on uh, the um, uh, boundary conditions we are applying, so we are applying a constant deformation, so a linear displacement field along the boundaries that uh, is related to a, a constant deformation at the macroscopic level, uh, plus uh, a um, fluctuation that uh, stems from the heterogeneities, that derives from the heterogeneities. Um, in this case, um, you are at each uh, microscopic point, so at each uh, RV, you are able to apply on the constant deformation. So uh, you cannot uh, reproduce a case in which you have uh, at the macroscopic level, gradients, deformation gradients that varies uh, in, uh, in the structure rapidly. So this approach cannot be uh, used for this. Moreover, uh, the only um, typical deformation modes you are able to apply uh, at the uh, RV are these three that we have seen uh, before. So no flexural modes can be applied to the RV. So when you um, want to uh, reproduce uh, uh, at the macroscopic scale a loading condition that causes uh, bending modes, um, you can have uh, uh, not uh, um, satisfactory, uh, 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 satisfactory modeling uh, of these uh, phenomena exploiting this approach. Moreover, and this is important uh, in the case uh, we use uh, nonlinear uh, constitutive models for uh, for each phase at the microscopic scale, this approach is unable to describe localization phenomena. So um, uh, cases in which uh, the, uh, the finite element model typically exhibit mesh dependence. Um, in order to uh, overcome these limits, so the limits of the first order computational homogenization, Different approaches have been proposed in literature. Uh, in um, one case, so, in, so there are re really several, several approaches. So it is uh, not easy to uh, find a route, but here I, I try to, uh, to give you uh, some hints and some, um, some directions to, uh, to orient in this uh, very complicated um, topic. So uh, one uh, first uh, um, 
strategy to overcome, uh, one, one possible strategy to overcome uh, the problems is to retain the Cauchy continuum at the microscopic scale, since, uh, especially in case of nonlinear constitutive behavior, the uh, constitutive laws of plasticity, damage, viscoelasticity are well established in the, in the framework of the local continuum. But uh, considering at the macroscopic scale, uh, a non-local continuum. So a continuum that uh, um, is uh, enriched with respect to the classical continuum one, um, for example, uh, because it considers additional degrees of freedom in terms of displacement, in terms of, uh, of uh, stress and strains. So a continuum that is, for example, able to uh, reproduce, uh, to better reproduce bending phenomena or uh, the, the phenomenon of uh, uh, non-symmetric shear that is also exhibited in uh, uh, in uh, different uh, cases. So uh, within this uh, uh, idea, so considering Cauchy continuum at the macro scale and the non-local continuum at the macro scale, there are um, essentially uh, two uh, approaches. So uh, the first approach is uh, uh, the computational homogenization one. So within the same framework of the computational homogenization, uh, there are uh, several examples um, accounting for both higher order continua or micromorphic continua at the macroscopic scale. So this non-local continuum can be um, uh, either higher order continuum or micromorphic continuum. Another, um, another uh, possibility is uh, the use of uh, uh, asymptotic homogenization approach and variational asymptotic methods. In this case, you can obtain uh, in closed form uh, the uh, relation, the consecutive relation, uh, the, the expressions that, that, that directly relate uh, the constitutive terms at the macroscopic and at the microscopic point. And also in this case, uh, there are uh, several uh, attempts to uh, consider at the macroscopic scale higher order continua, uh, maybe one, uh, uh, okay, uh, maybe no one or one published in uh, very soon, <laughs> uh, micromorphic continuum, okay. So why, um, why uh, you can, so when uh, you uh, really need uh, a, an, an enhanced approach? So in which cases uh, the first order computational homogenization is uh, uh, really um, uh, and useful to actually reproduce the response of the heterogeneous medium. Uh, this happens when the typical size of the microstructure is comparable with the macrostructural one. So uh, in, there are several examples of heterogeneous materials. I will show you uh, very soon some examples in which the principle of scale separation does not hold. Uh, Furthermore, furthermore, in these cases, you can, um, the material uh, exhibit a behavior such that the size, the shape, and the arrangement of the constituents strongly affect the mechanical global response. So uh, if you have a microstructure with a small size or a big size, the response, the macroscopic response is uh, that, that you, for example, experience uh, experimentally is very different. So in this case, uh, our uh, first order homogenization scheme is uh, uh, blinded. So you cannot see the difference of, of size. Moreover, there are cases uh, in which um, uh, for example, uh, the material uh, exhibit uh, damage, so uh, damage phenomena occur, and in this case, you can have 
high deformation gradients in small portions of your, of your structure. So in all these cases, you really need to enhance the uh, formulation. And so um, uh, one uh, possible way that uh, in, in the previous uh, slide uh, falls within this, uh, this group, so computational homogenization scheme adopting a uh, micromorphic continuum, so a Cosera continuum at the macro scale and a micro uh, Cauchy continuum at the micro scale, um, a possible approach is this one. So uh, why uh, it is uh, um, so uh, um, um, by considering a 2 D uh, problem, why this approach is richer? Because the Cosera continuum um, gives rise to uh, additional deformation modes. For example, in 2D, it gives rise to three additional deformation modes besides these three ones that are the same as for Cauchy continuum, in particular, a skew-symmetric deformation and two curvatures. Um, here, there is a very simple, uh, so um, a very uh, schematic uh, representation of uh, displacement, degrees of freedom at the microscopic scale and at the macroscopic scale, together with the definition of constitutive law at the microscopic scale and uh, the definition of the uh, deformation, the, the strains measure, and the, the constitutive law at the macroscopic scale. So uh, in uh, um, Cosera continuum, there is an additional degrees of freedom at each point that is a microscopic rotation, so three. Um, uh, as a consequence, you can uh, have a description, uh, uh, so, um, here there are there is a split between the Cauchy um, strains that is this three and the Costera strains that are the, the that are this three and that are this three Costera one. So in the additional terms, you can see the role played by this uh, this um, um, additional degree of freedom. So the micro rotation is responsible for. Uh, skew symmetric shear uh, uh, and for curvature effect. Mm. When you, okay, so this is uh, a possible way. And uh, I, I have no time to go in the in depth of this uh, topic, but uh, okay, also this is a, a huge topic. A um, possible alternative to this is the use of non-local continua at both microscopic and macroscopic scales. And um, uh, so uh, there are, uh, so here uh, there is a, a non-complete uh, 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 list of, uh, of uh, uh, publications in, uh, in this uh, framework, uh, but uh, besides these uh, first seminal works, uh, I myself with uh, Professor Trivaluci and also uh, with uh, Marco here present, um, worked, uh, 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 worked on, uh, on this topic especially in the case of random media. And here you can see a list of publications. Um, so uh, how to uh, justify this choice? So um, in which case, for which material, for which heterogeneous material, uh, for, for what heterogeneous material this uh, choice can be uh, appropriate. Um, the use of a non-local continuum, as said by Gibson and Nashby, is a very natural way to obtain an explicit dependence of the effective 
properties of composites or multiphase materials on the absolute sides of the constituents. Um, because this uh, uh, non-local continuum, in, part in particular the Coursera continuum, is able to account for sides effects. So uh, the fact that we are able to account for uh, uh, the curvatures and for the non-symmetric shear, um, especially the curvature, um, gives rise in terms of in, in, in the constitutive relations to an explicit definition of a characteristic length. So in the, uh, in the constitutive uh, law uh, in the, in, of the Coursera medium, there are explicitly, uh, there is an explicit uh, definition of um, length scale that are uh, physically related to the absolute sides of the constituents of the heterogeneous medium. So for which materials uh, this um, is uh, a useful, uh, so a non-local continuum, in particular Coursera continuum, can, can be a useful tool in order to, uh, to uh, reliably uh, model the, uh, the response. For example, in, in granular materials, um, you can see that uh, in granular material, uh, each uh, grain can be uh, seen as uh, a rigid body uh, endowed with uh, three degrees of freedom, two displacement and one uh, rotation uh, that uh, interact with, uh, uh, interacts with the others. Uh, also in polycrystals, as well as in uh, honeycomb structures, because these structures can be seen as uh, the um, uh, as uh, um, uh, made by uh, beams, interconnected beams that typically exhibit bending effects. Uh, here, there is just an example of a three D uh, printed uh, honeycomb uh, reentrant uh, microstructure. So, um, we um, can so uh, assume that at the macroscopic level, we have a Coursera continuum, and also at the mesoscopic level, we have a Coursera continuum, because this continuum emerges from a further microstructure that is typically a beam-like structure. So uh, in this picture, um, um, the idea is that, so if you, uh, uh, if you can model each, uh, so in, imagine that you are at the mesoscopic level and you want to go uh, back to, a, to go down to a microscopic level, if your microstructure can be um, uh, represented uh, by a truss-like structure, your mesoscopic model uh, can be a Cauchy model. But if your microstructure uh, can be represented as a beam-like model, as for example, uh, these lattice structures made of uh, interconnected beams, you need for um, a richer um, description also at the mesoscopic level. So uh, you need a non-local continuum also uh, at the mesoscopic level. So when bending is a prominent deformation mechanism, a mechanism at the microscopic level, uh, it is useful to account for a non-local continuum, for example, a Coursera continuum at the microscopic level. And um, so uh, in this framework, um, uh, so I want to focus on uh, this particular framework. So the case uh, in which we have at both microscopic and macroscopic scale, a Coursera continuum in the uh, 2D case, it is uh, um, um, 
straightforward, uh, straightforwardly uh, possible to extend this to a 3D case. Um, so let's consider at the microscopic scale a uh, given material point and endowed with three degrees of freedom, two displacement and one um, uh, independent rotation. So the kinematics relations relate the uh, strains uh, to uh, the gradient of the displacement and to the uh, micro rotation as well as the curvature uh, uh, are related to the uh, gradient of the rotation. This for the kinematics. Besides this, uh, the balance equations, in the balance equation, you can see that besides the uh, divergence of uh, the uh, strain, stress, uh, sorry, stress tensor, there is a further equation that um, um, involve, involves couple stress and the skew-symmetric part of the stress. At the, boundary, at the boundaries, you uh, have traction boundaries and surface couples uh, in equilibrium with tau and mu. Um, it is useful to uh, so, in general, gamma and tau are um, non-symmetric uh, tensors. It is useful to split both the kinematic and uh, the, um, the, kin so the, 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 the strains and the stress into a symmetric part, so, um, so the symmetric, uh, the symmetric, symmetric part of the displacement gradient and the symmetric part of tau, and in into the skew symmetric part. In the skew symmetric part um, directly appears appears the um, the uh, rotation phi. With this in mind, we can write down uh, in uh, uh, this. Uh, um, engineering uh, uh, notation, the uh, constitutive relations, stress-strain relation for a linear elastic isotropic micropolar material. In this case, you see that besides lambda and mu, that are uh, the um, typical, uh, well-known uh, constitutive uh, constant for a Cauchy continuum, uh, two additional constants appear, mu c, that is uh, a shear constant related explicitly to the, the skew-symmetric part of the uh, stress and strain, and lc. lc is the characteristic length I mentioned before. And this characteristic length can be related to the dimension of the heterogeneities. So um, if we, uh, apply this homogenization scheme, um, we have uh, the following uh, situation. So we have at the macroscopic level, a micropolar continuum. At the mesoscopic level, a micropolar continuum. For each phase of the mesoscopic level, we know exactly the constitutive response because we know lambda, mu, Mu, mu C and LC of each phase at the microscopic level. And by applying the homogenization procedure, we can obtain uh, the uh, uh, averaged uh, values, the corresponding stress, uh, average stress values at the macroscopic level. Uh, macroscopic level in which we uh, don't know uh, the constitutive law, but this constitutive law is uh, directly extracted by solving the boundary value problem and by fulfilling this energy equivalence that is the same, uh, the same concept introduced by Hill, this energy equivalence between a macroscopic point and the RV. But in this case, as you can see here, uh, you cannot use the standard Hill-Mandel uh, uh, macro-homogeneity condition 
because your energy uh, accounts for additional terms that are related to the additional degrees of freedom uh, in terms of the skew-symmetric part of the stress and strain and the uh, couple stress and curvature terms. So these, uh, uh, the, the energy equivalence between the two levels is more complicated and is generalized. And uh, it is, uh, this is a topic that is uh, not yet well established in literature. So it's somehow an open problem. There are uh, various, uh, have been, there, there have been various attempts to uh, uh, solve uh, th this problem, but um, uh, the uh, uh, various attempts uh, are still uh, um, uh, requiring uh, some uh, modification and improvements. So uh, in this case, so the generalized macromogenity conditions, macromogenity condition is of this type. As you see, as I said before, there are beta alpha mu key that, the mu k that are additional terms. Uh, by um, exploiting, so by manipulating this expression, uh, it is possible to um, end up with uh, um, a generalized form of uh, il Mandel condition that accounts separately for the classical components. So these are exactly the same terms you can uh, find in Cauchy uh, continua. So when we apply the first order computational homogenization, but additional terms applies. So for the classical components, uh, we can, uh, uh, we can um, uh, fall uh, within exactly the same uh, boundary conditions uh, as uh, for uh, as seen for the uh, the um, Cauchy continuum. So when we apply um, traction boundary conditions or separately um, Dirichlet boundary condition, we are fulfilling this energy equivalence. Uh, for the micropolar components, uh, the uh, case is more complicated and coupling terms appear. So uh, the uh, solution of this term uh, requires uh, uh, more attention. In particular, I will not into details of this, but uh, it can be uh, demonstrated that when you um, have a uh, Coursera continuum in the 2D case in, in the time analyzing at both mesoscopic level and macroscopic level, besides, so uh, these are the uh, generalized Dirichlet type and Neumann type boundary conditions in the case of Coursera uh, uh, medium. So besides, uh, for example, considering Dirichlet boundary condition, besides the uh, standard uh, conditions in terms of displacement, also um, conditions in terms of the uh, independent rotation appear, depending both on the skew symmetric uh, uh, average uh, strain and on the curvatures. When you apply Neumann type boundary condition, uh, you uh, have uh, a um, uh, traction boundary, uh, you have traction boundary conditions that depend both on um, the Cauchy uh, stress and on the skew symmetric part of the uh, uh, stress of the um, uh, stress, uh, while uh, a further set of boundary condition is related to the application of uh, couples of um, boundary couples. 
that depends on the average of uh, the uh, um, cap of the uh, body couples at the macroscopic level. And uh, there is a coupling term with uh, beta, so the schismetric part of the stress. So the situation is more complicated. Here there is a, a simplified scheme that, uh, uh, that, uh, um, re uh, that resume, resumes all the set of boundary conditions. So these first three boundary conditions are exactly the same as we have seen before for Cauchy. Uh, this set of boundary condition is uh, applied uh, in addition instead. So uh, in this case, when, so considering the, the Riclet type boundary condition, this one that is maybe the most complicated is, uh, is related to the application of uh, a, uh, alpha ij uh, over bar. In this case, you have uh, uh, this type of uh, complicated uh, displacement uh, in terms of uh, both uh, displacement and uh, rotation. Uh, when you apply curvature, uh, you have uh, this, uh, this uh, 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 rotation applied along the boundaries. And um, as before, you can see the, uh, the associated defor deformation mode and the associated uh, contour plot of uh, stress uh, in the case of homogeneous material. So when you apply uh, uh, the curvatures, for example, uh, uh, K31, so the component K31 that is associated to this plot, uh, your uh, couple, your um, mu31, so uh, body couples mu31, are not constants, but are the one that uh, are associated to these deformation modes. So uh, you can see that you are in this case able to account also for non uh, constant uh, um, deformation modes and uh, stresses in a homogeneous material. Uh, similarly, uh, these are the Neumann type boundary conditions uh, schematized for uh, um, a 2D. Uh, square RV, the, the same uh, uh, reasoning, uh, reasoning applies but, uh, for this other type of boundary condition. And um, maybe last thing, I don't know uh, uh, how long can we go further, maybe five minutes more, it's enough. Okay. Ah, okay, but then, okay. Right. If you want, I can go, but uh, uh, not bad. Okay. 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 <laughs> so, um, last thing, then you are free, <laughs> finally free, uh, is, uh, um, uh, further possibility in applying, uh, let's say, periodic into uh, quotes boundary conditions in this case. Why uh, this uh, uh, definition is uh, in quotes? Because uh, when you have uh, a Coursera continuum, um, for example, considering a periodic uh, microstructure, if you uh, if you imagine the uh, deformations that are related to curvatures, uh, these deformations are not uh, really periodic. I mean, uh, go back to this slide. Let's see if I 
able to. Okay, uh, let's have a look to these. So, in the case of Kx, we can um, apply periodic boundary condition in case of the up of the top and bottom uh, sides of the RV. But if you see at uh, what if you see what happens at the uh, left and right sides, uh, they uh, undergo skew periodic displacement. So um, the, um, the the formation mode is uh, um, um, associated not to periodic boundary condition along the four boundaries, but to uh, periodic boundary condition along uh, two boundaries and the skew periodic along the others. The reverse applies to uh, when we apply chi, uh, k y. Uh, so in this case, the the vertical ages undergo periodic boundary condition while the uh, horizontal one skew periodic. If you uh, look at this deformation mode that is representative of a skew symmetric uh, deformation, along all the boundaries you have skew periodic condition. Um, in this case, so the um, periodic boundary conditions that you that to that that you have to apply are this one so you have uh, skew periodic boundary conditions for a e j and skew periodic or periodic boundary condition depending on uh, which is the deformation mode you are considering um, I think we can stop now. Okay, thank you, Maria Laura, uh, for your uh, um, rigorous and detailed uh, presentation concerning uh, homogenization, in particular, homogenization for uh, micropolar uh, media. Uh, I want just to add a note that is, if you can go back mm -hmm. to the macro homogeneity conditions generalized of the hill type. Okay, this one. Uh, starting from this uh, uh, generalized macro homogeneity condition that relates the, the work the, the, the work on the macro and on the representative micro model. It is possible, as uh, uh, Dr. De Bellis explained, to derive the boundary conditions to apply to the uh, RPI, to the boundary of the RPI. And uh, these conditions can be derived using the uh, divergence to, uh, by applying the divergence theorem. I just want to say that the question of uh, deriving uh, the, these boundary conditions is uh, still open in uh, the case of uh, Kosterat uh, media. And uh, if uh, one of you that are uh, interested in uh, uh, deepening uh, this uh, point, uh, we can uh, discuss in more detail because uh, the boundary conditions that uh, are applied, uh, that we applied in uh, many applications, uh, are not, were not uh, strictly derived from these uh, generalized macro-homogeneity conditions uh, concerning the uh, for instance, uh, considering the kinematical point of view, the rotations. Um, because uh, there are uh, some uh, uh, conditions that are present in the literature, and uh, we will send you some uh, specific paper uh, in the folder in which uh, all the uh, lecturer uh, will put uh, his uh, uh, presentation and uh, some, uh, uh, some papers that are useful to understand the presentation. But uh, 
these relations uh, were not derived directly from the macromogenity conditions. So if uh, some of you is uh, interested uh, in uh, deepening this aspect, uh, I will be glad to explain in detail and uh, work at, at this because uh, the, the conditions that must be applied in the uh, deformation mode of rotation should be uh, derived uh, using uh, the divergence theorem applied to, to this uh, kind of uh, condition. I don't know if you want to add something about this. That we have to solve. It's yeah. a very interesting point to, to define because in the literature, as, as far as in uh, my knowledge, our knowledge, uh, we don't know a specific contribution uh, contributions on this uh, specific point. Okay, it, it is uh, <laughs> a bit late, but maybe someone would like to ask something concerning the topic of this lecture. So she don't know. You can stop the registration now, Mark. Why not? Okay. 